from the top yep. and show okay. backing up. Well, we actually, have, yeah, we have quite a bit on the agenda here um, and a couple hours ahead if we need it. Um, my um, testimony today, if I understand the agenda, is going to cover the incentive program. Um, in addition, uh, fees for the use of electric vehicle charging stations under controlled by the state. Uh, after that, the transportation nexus to Vermont's climate and energy strategies, and that would include the Comprehensive Energy Plan and also uh, the Vermont uh, Climate Action Commission's recommendations. Um, and then the last topic would be the EV charging network in Vermont. Uh, I'll go over the state goals for a highway corridor fast charging network and also talk about the VW uh, grant program for charging. Um, if I need to put my name on the record again, it's Dan Dutcher, Environmental Policy Manager with DTRANS. Um, so um, I, I'm going to kick around a lot of acronyms, and some of them you might know, but if you don't, just stop me. Uh, EV would be electric vehicles, of course, and when I talk about EVs, it means pure battery electric vehicles or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. The non-plug-in <coughs> hybrids are considered conventional technology already. They're not really included in our policies or metrics. But the term EV does include plug-in hybrids. Correct. Yes. Um, EVSE is electric vehicle supply equipment. <laughs> <laughs> um, for our purposes, it means charging equipment. Um, I think they <coughs> called it supply equipment to maybe eventually cover um, hydrogen electric vehicles, but so we're not. Acronyms take longer. To Say. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so those are the, the basic ones, and there's some more as we go. And just, just stop me. And um, I got four main subject areas, and I'll stop after each one for questions. But I really welcome and encourage questions as I go. It'll just break it up a little. What we try to do, Dan, is at least we're on the section. Let you get through it, and we just interrupt you with clarification. Okay then broader discussion after I get through. Yeah, maybe at the end of each section. And maybe you could tell us when you I, I will tell you. Great. Okay. So um, first uh, item, an EV incentive program for low and moderate income Vermonters. Um, first, the, the reasons for the incentive program. And I think you've got the uh, section in the, the current draft of the transportation bill uh, behind me. Um, the, uh, the draft section contains the proposed findings as well as the basic elements of the program. One of the biggest barriers to EV adoption is the upfront cost of the vehicle. There's a lot of uh, research and experience now to back that up. Um, and purchase incentives have uh, been proven to be uh, an effective means of overcoming that barrier. Uh, the purchase incentives are linked to increased sales of EVs and consumers who take advantage of incentives uh, regularly report that the incentives played an important part in their decisions to enter the EV market. In its <laughs> final report, the Vermont Climate Action Commission, which I'm going to talk about more later, uh, recommended building it, uh, an EV point of sale consumer incentive. And uh, Governor Scott took that up in his um, budget address and called for a 1.5 million EV purchase and lease incentive program. Uh, VTRANS, with the assistance of the Agency of Natural Resources and the Public Service Department, uh, put together the basic elements of this program and uh, drafted the proposed legislation that's now uh, in the T-Bill. Uh, many Vermonters lease uh, rather than own their vehicles, and many Vermonters uh, who purchase vehicles purchase used vehicles. So the proposed program uh, is intended to cover both new and used EVs as well as both purchases and leases. Uh, the, the proposed program is designed to benefit low and moderate uh, income Vermonters in order to help ensure that all uh, income strata and all regions of Vermont start to enjoy the benefits of vehicle electrification as quickly as possible. Transportation energy burdens are especially high for rural low income Vermonters and the incentive combined with the lower fueling and maintenance costs of EVs could significantly lessen the transportation burden. 
uh, for Vermonters. In addition to directly benefiting the consumers who take advantage of the incentive, this program will function as an education and outreach uh, system to a broad segment of Vermont society. The central task in electrifying Vermont's fleet as quickly as possible is to bring EVs to rural areas and to all income levels. Uh, vehicle electrification is not going to work unless it works for everyone. Uh, EV owners tend to be very satisfied with their vehicles, so this program will help get the word around about EVs and help move Vermont toward a renewable transportation system. And so moving to the elements of the EV incentive program, um, right now I think the bill is drafted has the Public Service Department in the lead, but um, we're still working that out. It could be VTrans. Uh, it's just going to depend on you know, uh, budgeting and capacity and that kind of thing. So uh, we have to uh, iron that out still, but one of us will, will take the lead on it uh, and um, administer the new program. And whichever agency does not take the lead will play a supporting role and the Agency of Natural Resources will also be involved. The three agencies, VTRANS, um, A&R, and the Public Service Department uh, tend to coordinate very closely on uh, vehicle electrification issues and we also bring in other agencies including uh, buildings and general services and the department of health um, we're also going to um, try to coordinate marketing for this new program uh, with existing uh, and new uh, distribution utility ev and evse purchase incentives you're probably aware the uh, utilities uh, tend to have their own incentive programs as part of tier three of vermont's renewable energy standard. Um, also, part of the incentive program will involve trying to recruit utilities to provide a level two home charger uh, to be offered in conjunction with the EV purchase incentive. And the uh, level two chargers would uh, you know, also be provided under tier three of the re renewable energy standard. Uh, tier three requires the utilities to help Vermonters reduce their um, use of fossil fuels for Heating and transportation. Excuse me, Dan. Yes. I think this question actually is for uh, Michelle. Uh, this this is a little different than what I've got in here. Is that uh, the, the section that you want? Okay, so the section that you wanted to take out is actually already out yeah. of this draft. So yeah. You might. It must have opened up the last minute. So. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Um, so as the program would be structured, um, incentives of uh, $2,500 would be available to households with income levels between 100% and 140% of the state's most recent median household income. Uh, the MHI uh, right now is somewhere in the neighborhood of $58,000. And then additional incentives up to about twice that amount would be available to households below the MHI. And this approach, just depending how it shakes out, could translate into two or 300 grants over the course of the program. The MSI? MHI, Median Household Income. So we're, essentially we're talking about household incomes between about 58,000 and maybe $78,000, something like that. Ballpark, do you know how much an electric vehicle costs? Uh, there's the the whole range, yeah. right? And I'm not exactly sure how much the low end ones are. Thirty thousand, twenty-five thousand. Um, I think you can get down to about twenty-two thousand, roughly. Uh, and the reason for sort of taking the spread approach on this is that a lot of low-income households may not qualify for the federal tax break, and so we're trying to sort of increase the opportunity. Uh, through this program um, to account for that. Yeah, so I just wanted to know what, how much it would cost less this incentive. All right, well, what yeah. we'll do maybe is bring back some examples okay. of different uh, vehicles, um, both on the purchase and on the lease side, okay. and give you an idea of what that might look like. Thank you. That'd be good. And Michelle, just as you're doing that, I'm sorry, but if you could include any um, information on use, I think it's probably yep. early days, but there yep, would be. Absolutely. Beginning. So. Yeah, if anyone watched the Super Bowl, you might have seen the um, ad for the Audi e-tron. Um, 
that's not going to cost $25,000. Does it exist yet? No, you, you can make reservations. So, so with at current funding levels that's in the proposed budget, I just wanted to make sure that, that I heard you right. You said two or three hundred, correct? Yes. Is what you're anticipating in FY 2020? Something, uh, or over the two years of the program. Okay. Yeah. Check the map on that one. Yeah. Okay. It, it depends on interest and uh, because there's going to be a range, the 2,500 would be the baseline, but then there'd be an increased grant for lower income levels. So the exact number would depend on the level of interest. Um, and uh, so the idea here is that the uh, base uh, uh, manufacturer's suggested re retail price of $35,000 or less would be eligible. So the program wouldn't be funding luxury vehicles. Uh, the program, uh, as I just mentioned, would run for two years from the date the state makes the first incentive payment available or until the funds uh, are fully obligated. Uh, and the idea would be to spread the incentives evenly across the two years to the extent possible. And funding would be available on a first come first serve basis in each year of the program. And uh, subject to state procurement requirements, the lead agency, uh, public service department or uh, VTRANS may retain Drive Electric Vermont as a consultant to assist with marketing program development and administration and we're anticipating up to $75,000 of program funding would be set aside for that purpose. So that's the, the reasons why we're doing this and the basic elements of the program as we've been able to think it through to this point and this would be a good time to stop and take questions or discussion. Mark. So to follow up on my earlier question, you know, I, I see in the findings the, the opportunity that the, the governor emphasized in his budget address is really re-emphasized around the transformational amount of money we could save for monitors if we really convert to EVs. I'm really excited to see uh, a point of sale incentive. Um, I'm wondering how this compares to our neighbors like Massachusetts and their EV incentive policy. And I'm also wondering um, what performance indicators are we really looking at? And there's reference to the comprehensive energy plan. And when I look at where we are now and the couple thousand EVs that are referenced here and the 50,000 that we're talking about trying to have in Vermont's fleet in just five or six years, two or 300 grants, how do, how do we, it just seems like a, a very small drop in the bucket, an important one, a good start, but how is the agency really seeing the this contributing to that bigger goal and how, how do we get from here to there? Well, two parts to your question. One, what are other states doing? Uh, I don't have a graph or a table on that, and I think it's a kind of a shifting landscape. They're sort of cobbling things together as well as they can, and uh, as we are here, uh, you know, with the funding available. So we could get you more information on that. Um, the um, second part of your question really goes to metrics, and uh, how do we really know that this is going to make a difference? And this is a question that's come up at conferences that I've been to involving other states. And there's not really a great answer to that. I don't know that we can do this on a totally sort of quantitative level in terms of, all right, exactly what kind of yield are we going to get from this investment? Um, essentially, what we know is that the incentives work. People do take advantage of them, and they get into the market, and then word gets around. So um, I, I don't really have a, you know, a better, more robust uh, way to ground this program other than that. That's a really good question. The second one. The first one was okay, also. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle, maybe someone could analyze um, past incentive programs, their purpose being to jumpstart a market yep. that, that is not good now and that we want to see happen. Yep. It might not even be in transportation. When, when the government does that, when has it worked, when has it not, and how much does it take uh, you know, I mean, to be effective, to have the effect that we want? Not just to subsidize something for a while and then stop subsidizing it. We're back to where we were. 
Well, we know from the um, Nissan LEAF experience that the incentive there was very effective. Uh, Vermont persuaded Nissan to uh, come here and use this as a kind of a laboratory to sell the, I think it was a 2018 LEAF, possibly. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a $10,000 incentive. And we ended up selling more LEAFs here than anywhere except someplace in California. So, and uh, some of the research has shown that if you make the incentive robust enough, people who weren't even in the market for a new car will go out and buy an electric vehicle just because they want the deal. So we do know they work, you know, exactly where the cutoff level is. I'm not so sure, but the utilities have offered more modest incentives and they don't seem to be having any trouble getting rid of the money. Then you gotta ask, well, would these people have purchased an electric vehicle anyway? Uh, you know, kind of hard to know. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, Molly. Sort of following up on Mike's question, maybe asking a different way. So, we must know, like, how many, what is the impact of X number of electric vehicles on X number of emissions? Can, can we know that? Yeah, and there's, I think there's a rough way to calculate so that. So, I think that, I think that's sort of, in a way, what we're, well, at least what I'm thinking about is, how do we know, okay, if we're gonna, uh, if, if, you know, if so many electric vehicles are bought, what would the impact be on our emissions? We know that our emissions have, have gone up. Yep. We know that in order to meet our statutory goals, we need to start on the downward trend. Yep. So that would be something I would be really interested in knowing so that we can set some right. benchmarks, you know, yep. okay? So we know that, uh, if, if we do this incentive program, we're going to reduce it. This this is going to have this percentage of impact on our emissions. Right. Not that it's the only thing, you know, along with weatherization, or anything, but just specifically for this program, I would be really interested. Right. In that. Well, I can tell you that um, even if this program is phenomenally successful, uh, two and a half years from now, or whenever it's over. Uh, it depends on other trends, but we still have a very small percentage of electric vehicles out of the total fleet. So, you know, you're not going to see uh, a dramatic effect from this program alone. No, but right. we could see, like, what impact it's having and what might need to happen in the future. Yes. For example, you know, if, if the goal is, what, you know, 10% of the fleet by 2025 and 25% by 2030, mm -hmm. what, would that, what would that mean? Yeah. Well, we do track some of that. Uh, V-Trans um, issues a transportation energy profile every two years, and we contract with the University of Vermont Transportation Research Center. And I'm going to talk a little more about this later, but one of the things the profile does is really the main thing it does is to specifically track um, how the transportation sector is doing with respect to the goals in the Comprehensive Energy Plan for transportation. And part of that is greenhouse gas reduction um, you know, and greenhouse gas emissions. It, some of the metrics are extremely difficult to come up with. Um, so even the transportation energy profile uses um, estimates. The Agency of Natural Resources gets into more detailed um, data, but it takes them a long time. So there's a, a, like a at least a few year lag uh, between the data they use and the time they get the report out because I, I think there's some pretty sophisticated modeling involved. So uh, you, you know we can dive as deep as you want to on, on this. It's, it gets pretty thorny. <laughs> okay. And more questions on the incentive program? Yeah, I have one more. Uh, and I've heard talk about the used cars, but, um, why? I mean, I, I purchased far more used cars than I ever had new cars. Right. Not that I'm against used cars, but um, I'm, not, I'm wondering why that makes sense. Well, the idea... The used cars already there. You know, that's that's right. car that's in the market. Right, so how's it going to move the market, right. in other words? Um, it's certainly a fair question. The thinking is that most um, people do buy used cars, and one of the ideas here is to try to get a broad segment of our society into electric vehicles. Um, and 
if we apply the incentive to used cars, it will give you know more people an opportunity to get into vehicle electrification. And as I said, most people are quite impressed once they start driving electric and they want to stick with it. So it would have a kind of marketing and education effect. I'll just add to Dan's comments, which would be um, one of the key incentives is to make sure that low-income households have the opportunity to participate in this market because it will be a significant transportation savings in their household budget to be driving electric versus driving um, a non-electric vehicle. Mary? Uh, and I, I think I, I've heard somewhere that um, electric vehicles on the Market seem to go back out of state. Um, why is that, and how do we keep them here? Can we work with um, manufacturers or those? Are, um, that issue was addressed by the Vermont Climate Action Commission and some of its recommendations. Um, so the question has been raised. I'm not sure if the answer has been discovered at this point, but cer certainly that problem has been recognized and. Um, you know, that's something we have to figure out. I'm wondering what the proposal looked at. Did you work with dealerships to come up with this number? I was really impressed with, there's a Northeast Kingdom based dealership who the lease model of the LEAF was their best selling lease, just flat out compared to any other vehicle because it had the lowest monthly payment. So did you, when you created this, was, was there conversations with dealerships on what that would, what would bring it down to a monthly payment that would be comparable to other cars? Do you know the Well, answer? what I can say is that we've been involved over the past decade with Drive Electric Vermont. Um, and part of the membership of Drive Electric Vermont is not only governmental and nonprofit and utilities, but also automobile dealers. And so we have been sort of in this conversation four to five times a year as we meet um, about what trends work and what direction things um, appear to be successfully moving in. So it's kind of based on that broad exposure and experience. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations in that group with Lamar Valley Ford um, and um, other dealers who have had um, good success and so we knew that that was an element that worked for a lot of consumers and thought it might be important to include that. And, okay. I guess my question was a, a little bit around the folks who are able to get a lease based on this income, if this is actually the group that would then be able to take advantage of the incentive. Um, I guess our research wasn't as deep as the question you're asking to okay. answer. Um, you know, in terms of qualifying for a lease, is that what your question is? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Robert? That blends a little bit into mine, because just my concern with the used is the cost of the battery, um, and that the incentive has to take into account that someone buying the lesser car, because that's all they can afford, needs to be protected from buying something that's going to need several thousand dollars up to easily 10, seems to be kind of the figure used as a replacement part and who knows what future. Um, so just the lease program, I think, protects people a little bit from that um, extended cost, that hidden cost in a way. Well, everyone's asking really interesting questions. It's almost in the nature of econometrics. You know, how do we actually quantify what we're doing, and figure out what the yield is going to be mathematically, and we're not quite that sophisticated at this point. I just had a quick question. I think you mentioned it, but I might have missed it. How much is this incentive program going to cost? And is it built into the budget, or is it an, uh, anticipated revenues that we might see from increased uh, forecast? The proposal is a $1.5 million program over the course of two years. Yeah. And this idea was generated uh, by the Climate Action Commission. Um, after a state settlement with Volkswagen involving consumer fraud. Mm -hmm. And um, the Climate uh, Action Commission suggested to the governor that uh, a portion of that settlement uh, be used for this kind of purpose. And the, I, I think it was the administration that came up with a $1.5 million figure. I'm not exactly sure about that. 
and there will be a separate um, line in the appropriations bill to fund this. So it's not in our budget, it's across the our, our yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, this is not in the transportation program budget, this is in the general fund budget. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be a separate line in the general fund appropriation uh, directing these uh, these resources. Okay. And but we're using both from, from the settlement funds, yep. which basically those settlement funds, after the attorney generals sort of cut off the top of any settlements the state receives, um, they go into the general fund. and. Um, I think while the Climate Action Commission had suggested 3.6 million, which was the actual settlement, not taking into account the AG's fees, be the amount, the resources um, from that particular settlement, settlement had already been um, distributed into the general fund and used for other purposes. And so um, there was a carve out in, in, of funds that um, will come from the general fund and potentially in um, from other settlements that may be pending related to uh, similar cases uh, to the one, the VW consumer fraud one. So we, we're uh, pinpointing $1.5 million in general fund. You know, if more settlements come on board, we would hope to enhance the program through those resources. So this, this 3.6 million uh, is on top of the 18 .6. That was a different settlement, right. So is it subject to the same restrictions? No, and, and the 15 percent. It's not. It's completely different, and, and those funds are gone. So, so it just it no. lacks restrictions. It, sounds like. it lacks restrictions. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't have the same restrictions as the uh, other VW settlement. So, would you have to come back to us if you did with more lawsuits came about and we received more money? Is this built into it, or how would that work? Uh, no, to there would need to be um, a um, either if other settlements occurred before the end of this session, and mm -hmm. we were able to. Uh, Incorporate those into the appropriations recommendation, then that would happen before the session. Otherwise, we'd have to come back next year uh, and uh, request those funds. Potentially, if there was a settlement between, you know, June first and um, and the end of the year, calendar year, we might do it through budget adjustment to bring more money in. But mm -hmm. given that it's a two-year program, you know, we'd have to look at. Do we need to act immediately, or if it's only another five hundred thousand dollars, can we just do it through the regular legislative yeah. process because it's a two-year program? So this, you know, so we're committed to one point five. So that could e mean it may or may not run out. So it could be a one-year program. We don't really know how long. Um, how long? How long you, how long I think we would um, we would probably make an effort to uh, phase the money over two years. Okay. Um, just from the standpoint of uh, the fact that there will be. A little bit of startup time to get the program up and running and advertised, etc. We want to raise awareness and, and not just have the money go out to the door to a particular mm -hmm. group of folks who learned about it, but maybe everybody wasn't aware of it yet. So I think there's an important point of being deliberative about having it be a two-year um, program. And those rules will be done internally. We want to see those be done after the fact. Yeah, I mean, discussion. we would just develop a program okay. based on the general guidance that was provided by the legislature, rather than having, um, you know, it, it's not something that would um, lend itself to rulemaking necessarily because it's a one-time mm -hmm. program. It's a small amount of money. Uh, it's you know going to have um, you know a, a, a transparent you know process for awarding things. I, I don't know that it would. Um, be something that would, you know, just be done under a program. Guidelines. Sure. Okay. Um, and when you say the funds are gone, I mean, basically the money was put into the general fund, right? Right. Um, and so that's okay. The governor can do that without our authority to just. Um, I am not an expert in the nuances of how settlements come to the state and then how they get incorporated into the budget, but I believe that those. Those were those funds were received and budgeted and implemented wherever they went last year. Now um, I, I know Neil is in the room, and I don't know if Neil has any other background than I have on this. Um, but we could certainly get somebody from um, the budget <coughs> office to come in and explain how settlements are distributed. Uh, I'm afraid I just don't have the detail for that. Well, the fact is, you you recommended this money. In the big bill, yeah. the legislature can say yes or no. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or do, or do or something else entirely with that. Yeah. 
Sure. And this is not settlement year. money. This yeah. is just general fund money. The three six three point six million that was in last year's big bill. We put it in the public and the settlement. Now, my understanding is that part of the settlement um, is available each year. Yep. Right. So. Uh, well, how many years, Neil? Until it's gone. Ten. I don't know. Ten years. Ten years. That's what I heard. Well, there's two different settlements we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. There's the 18 million dollar VW settlement, which has nothing to do with what we're proposing right now. Totally different program. That has all kinds of different criteria and restrictions. This other consumer fraud uh, settlement, um, it was you know money that came to the state. My understanding, as Neil pointed out, was that it was received into the general fund last year. The legislature, you know, approved. However, those funds were used for whatever general fund program they wanted. They needed the hole to fill, and so we're just like a, a saying that you know there there will be new general fund money that is being you know, recommended for this program. There may or may not be a sort of revenue source from a case that fills that sort of pot of money, but one way or another, the state will make this program available. Um, if you're interested in more detail about the 3.6 and how that you know, sort of went around the books, I'm happy to get somebody in that can talk about that. I'm gonna just go ahead. Yeah, well, now I was talking to me just yesterday. The speaker asked me to look into all this because I think she was concerned that uh, a lot of people are spending this money. Mm -hmm. it's spent, you know, the 3.6 times over. No, all of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the it might help if I, I can clarify something. Well, um, I just what, sure. What, she, what, what I did, right. her request really was I asked for a memo from Joint Fiscal. Okay. She suggested it was Stephanie that would write that memo for me. And, um, and then I also talked to Ellen, I forget her last name, but she, she's like said council. She, she used to work with Aaron, now she has Aaron's job. Uh, and she actually knows a lot about this. I didn't realize this. She used to work at the uh, U.S. Uh, Justice Department. Yes. And when this was happening, so she knows all about it. She's going to write me now on, um, you know, how the money can be spent, how it cannot be. Yeah, because there's like four different there. settlements that came yeah. to the state or something like that, and, and Dan has some of those details. I, I, I'm going to talk sure a, a little bit more about this later on, but I, it might be helpful to say right now that the $18.7 million that came to Vermont was the result of a national settlement. Um, and that was Vermont's allocation based on the number of vehicles sold in Vermont with emissions to feed devices. And that full national settlement is controlled uh, by the terms that they came up with in the Northern District of California, wherever this happened. Um, and a and is administering those funds, and I'll get into more details later. As Michelle said, those funds are not being used for this, and they could not be used for this uh, under the rules. Then in addition to the national settlement, there have been state lawsuits under our own consumer fraud laws. And I think the $3.6 million that we're talking about may be the second one. The first, the results of the first one, the money from the first one, I think just sort of vaporized in the general fund. So the Climate Commission kind of pounced on this one because it came along, I think last summer, um, and they said, look, some of this should be used for an incentive program. So that, that's sort of the broad context. Couldn't some of the up to 15% of the 18 be used for this? No, it can be used for um, charging to, stations? Yes, for charging stations and for education and outreach, but not for incentives. Okay. And even that's only up to 15% of the 18. Correct. Uh, I think that Mike, Patty, no, Mike, and then what? So the, the co chairs of the Climate Action Commission, am I remembering this correctly? They, they signed a letter. That said, that all of the 3.6 million should go to an electric vehicle incentive program, and then the the climate caucus during budget adjustment also wrote a letter to appropriations, recognizing and referencing that letter, and and so that 3.6 million really disappeared in between 
the beginning of the fiscal year in budget adjustment, right? I mean, that, that's not our that, understanding. And that's why I think having an expert come in might be helpful. Okay, that would be great because there, in this building, there are a lot of people who are telling very different stories about what happened to that money. And to see 3.6 million become 1.5 when you had a very bipartisan uh, recommendation from a thoughtful commission that said this money should be spent in this way, that was frustrating to a lot of us. And I was a member of that commission, so I understand um, the concerns. And, um, and and I know we worked on this through December, trying to understand what the, month, the amount was that was available, because we thought it was 3.6. And then we received communications from our budget office, from the you know, commissioner of finance, that this that, that money was not available. So I'd, I'd love to find out more yeah. as well. <laughs> I'm thinking it's 3.6 minus 2 that went to the uh, 2.0's yeah. office, and that leaves the 1.6. Did you say the 2 million what? To the uh, Attorney General. Because I think we should look at that money, and it's not the settlement, it's, it's like damages. And you, you, know, you can do what you want with damages. Right? And like, even when you sue somebody because you're hurt, uh, two things you have the health, the medical costs, but then there's just damages. That's just money that you get. I think, you know, without restrictions, go on through it. Okay. Anything else on the incentive program? No, so you, you, I think you've got some questions. Yeah, we got the list. Yeah, great. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so I know you're very good at that. <laughs> I don't mean to insult you. No, 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 no. I don't take it that way. Okay, so the next topic is fees for the use of state-owned or controlled uh, charging infrastructure. I think there's a section in here about that, starting here. Um, so right now, under current law, agencies cannot charge the public. Uh, fees that are not specifically authorized by law, um, just sort of as a general operating rule. So um, VTRANS, uh, Agency of Natural Resources, Public Service Department, and Buildings and General Services uh, collaboratively drafted um, this proposed section of the Transportation Bill that would authorize state agencies to charge a fee uh, for the use of state-owned or controlled um, electric vehicle charging equipment. Um, so VTRANS has purchased two um, pure battery electric vehicles, a Nissan LEAF and a Chevy Bolt, and plans to purchase additional EVs going forward. VTRANS installed a level two charger at its um, DIL uh, office building in Berlin and plans to install a fast charging station in White River Junction. Um, VTRANS will most likely purchase additional EVSE to keep its um, growing electric fleet charged. Um, VTRANS would like to make the charging infrastructure available to its employees uh, to charge their own vehicles and also to members of the public visiting VTRANS facilities. However, to do so, VTRANS needs to be able to charge a fee uh, to help recover its costs. And this section of the transportation bill would, would enable VTRANS and other agencies to do that. Other agencies have their own fleets, and uh, BGS runs the state motor pool, which includes EVs and uh, EVSE, and which continues to electrify. So other situations could arise where a state agency may need to charge a fee for the use of electric vehicle charging equipment. Although the agencies are not right now planning to get into the EV charging business, an agency may at times need to take over a public charging station. We have an example of that right now. Uh, the Washington Electric Co-op installed and currently runs the charging station at the Middlesex Park and Ride, but under the agreement between Washington Electric Co-op and the state, the equipment will soon belong to VTRANS. It was a sort of limited period, and they, the deal was they'd leave the equipment behind when they were done, sort of a pilot-type pro program. So VTRANS will uh, need to be able to charge uh, for the use of this equipment um, unless uh, VTRANS finds another third party that can somehow take over. So other scenarios could arise where VTRANS or another agency enters into a public-private partnership 
with a third party providing EV charging on state land uh, with the state owning the EVSC at the end of the lease. In the near term, uh, VTRANS and other agencies uh, may not realistically be able to fully recover their costs from the use of their EVSC by their employees and the public. Full cost recovery may require charging prices uh, that would need to be set unrealistically high. The proposed legislation allows for the changing economics around EVSC um, by permitting the agencies to charge below cost, at cost, or at the regional market rate as a kind of cap. It could be difficult for state agencies to determine exactly what their costs would be in some situations. And uh, this regional market rate uh, would act as a sort of a, a cap or a, a, a high end on charging fees by the state and could be determined by looking at prices set by publicly available charging stations in the area. By not limiting um, state agencies to their charging costs uh, and by not requiring the agencies to go through a review process every time they want to charge, uh, change their charging fees, the proposed legislation would end up treating um, EV charging fees differently from other authorized fees. Um, people have no choice when it comes to permits and transcripts and other matters that the fee statutes address. Uh, linking fees to costs and requiring ch changes in fees to undergo legislative review for these matters is therefore appropriate. Um, however, the state doesn't have a monopoly over EV charging, so if people don't like the price that uh, the agency is asking, they do have the option to charge elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> so it makes it sense to afford the agency some discretion for how much they charge for the use of their chargers so the agencies can set prices at the level they determine would best advance uh, vehicle electrification while also recovering their cost to the extent practicable. So that, that's the idea of the change uh, to the fee statute. Uh, you know, we found out that we, ha we have these charging stations. We thought it would be a good idea to let employees and the public use them, but then we found out we couldn't charge them for using them. So then the issue came up, well, okay, <laughs> how much should we charge and that kind of thing, and that seems to be kind of a moving target. So what we've done here and what we're asking for is some flexibility uh, in that regard so we can try to manage it, manage the situation according to our best judgment. Marley, in the back. I'm just wondering about the other parking garage. There's some that other parking garage that we can get an exit on Who's, who's oh, charging? Sorry, I'm asking about the um, uh, charging stations that are at some of the park and ride lots on I-91. And there's, I know there's one at exit nine. I think there's one at exit eight. I think there's one in Cotton at exit four. So who owns those? And would those be subject to this? Yeah. Um, do you know who owns those? Um, <coughs> I think um, exit eight, which is the Berlin. Facility? Is that what you No, I'm thinking about exit eight um, on uh, that's um, Windsor. Oh, down, down in 91. Yeah, that's right. um, off the top of my head, I'm afraid I don't know okay. who owns those. Um, or, you know, if their properties are being leased to a charging infrastructure company or how those work. But okay. I'm happy to come back to the committee with those details. Just curious. I think the, the point of this is we want to be able to both um, enter into agreements with uh, charging company providers so that we can have chargers at park and rides if that's the right location or at a state office complex or other places where the public may be frequenting and dwelling for you know for level two charging or just passing through for level three um, park and rides or state locations may or may not be the, the right spot. Dan's going to talk more about where we're citing charging around the state later in his presentation. But I think we also um, really more to the point want to make sure that if we have charging stations on state property that we're managing or are in an agreement with another company on that we are able to um, promote those as available to employees and the public and not have to say Oh, we have one here, but you can't drive for it and use it because we can't charge you for using it. So, 
Yeah, we don't, just to follow up, we don't know exactly what the state's role in all this is going to be going forward. But, you know, everybody around the country is kind of making this up as they go, and it's a little bit of trial and error. But we think right now, as I mentioned earlier, we're probably not interested in getting into the charging business. So we'll buy EVSC for our own fleet and try to make it available to people through this bill. But in places like park and rides, where we don't need the equipment for ourselves, as Michelle said, what we anticipate is getting into sort of public-private partnerships where we would make the land available, but somebody else would own and control and operate the equipment. And it, uh, one good reason for doing that is because there are many, but one, one reason is that VTRANS is responsible with other agencies for administering a lot of the grant money that's going out right now for EVSC. And if we started <laughs> you know, taking grant money or that kind of thing, we'd be dis disqualified from participating in that process, and we don't want to do that. The EVFC so. is a fast charger? No, that's electric vehicle supply equipment, and it just refers to electric vehicle charging stations. Okay. The fast chargers, if you want another acronym right now, would be DCFC, D D direct current fast charger. Aren't they all there? Have a test. They're not, no. They're not? Okay. Um, Becca and then Barbara. Um, so yeah, you've kind of answered the start of my question, which is I'm, I'm not really understanding the difference between the private-public partnership and just having uh, like EVgo or Charge be the third-party provider. So it, just for the example, right. I'm in White River Junction. I'm so excited about a level three charger. Um, well, I have an EV. Mm -hmm. Would it be that I would go to VTrans and you would have a private public partnership with EVgo and I'd use my card like I do everywhere else? Or is this a totally separate world? Um, it, it, it depends how it works out. Um, it's possible that VTrans could contract with a company like EVgo even for its own charging equipment. And one of the things that ups the price is the software that goes with it. And if we want to um, allow employees and members of the public to use some of this equipment, it's going to have to come with a software so you can put your credit card through and you know figure out what you're paying and, and all the rest. So you know that's one option to, to have somebody else just run the equipment completely. Um, another option would be because VTrans might be using this or will be using some of it for its own fleet that VTrans would own it and we'd still have to figure out how to charge people um, yeah. and so I don't I don't have all the answers to that right now and just to follow up on that one more thing I I am really interested in that question because I don't understand the regional market rate because and I could be completely wrong, I assume that the provider like EVgo set that rate. So I don't know if that language is facilitating a relationship with those third party providers or if this is really saying VTrans would do it and that would just be the automatic. Well, what's intended by the term regional market rate is just what others are charging in the area. Oh, okay. That's all that means. It's not a sort of administratively established rate. Can I just um, yes. follow on on that related to Dan's response? Um, one of the things we're grappling with is that the EV market rate is immature at this point, and there are no set regulations at this point related to um, notifying the consumer how much they're being charged for their charging, because currently uh, in Vermont, you cannot charge, you know, by the kilowatt hour as a provider of an EV charging station. Um, so you set either a per hour rate or something of that nature. The Public Utility Commission has a docket open and they are looking at helping to standardize um, and allow for uh, charging on a um, per kilowatt basis or whatever. We also need to um, find a way to create transparency in this market so that when a consumer goes up to the charging station, like just when they go to the gas pump, they know the rate is X amount of kilowatt uh, per kilowatt hour or hour or whatever. So um, at this point, we don't even, other than going around to all the charging stations, but we have to be members of some of them to find out what the rate would be, we don't have a mechanism for that. And some of our chargers may be inside the fence, so to speak. In other words, we may have our own fleet of vehicles and we just have our own private charging station, just like we have our own private gasoline pump. 
for our vehicles. Um, so it's not we're not too here to imply that any charging station that VTrans develops will be publicly available. Okay. Just want to clarify that. Thank you. Barbara and then Neil. Um, I had a couple of questions, and one I'm glad Anthea is with us because I would be curious on page 21, lines 3, 4, and 5, speaking to the um, state being subject to the same laws, specifically governing the EV charging stations. I'd love to see what those are because um, they're referenced, but they currently there are not yeah. Okay, so, so <laughs> okay, that's one answer because it also, I remember in prior session um, talking with the Public Service Board trying to figure out this whole how do we charge piece. And, and um, I'm a little concerned that this language does remove um, our voice from the conversation because I'm not really hearing anything about how we do um, balance the fact that a gallon of gas helps pay for a inch of roadway and and that's not in this conversation yet um, that I've heard so I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're taking our um, voice out of the conversation when I think we have a very clear and um, important concern well that's not intended at all didn't mean to cut you off there um, as Michelle said there's a lot of uh, going on other than what we're talking about today the Public Utility Commission is looking into highway user fees for electric vehicles and they are uh, I, I'm always reluctant to make predictions but I am certain they are going to allow charging by the kilowatt hour I mean nothing else really makes sense and I'm confident also that they're going to um, largely or entirely remove their jurisdiction over charging stations that aren't run by public utilities um, so you know lots is happening and they're probably going to put uh, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets uh, in charge of the weights and measures piece to make sure that, uh, you know, the price is known and so forth. So uh, all that is being worked on. I think Riley Allen might be coming in here on Friday, mm -hmm. and he can tell you all about the Public Utility Commission's work. He's with the Department of Public Service. Uh, Neil. Oh, yeah, Neil, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I Correct in assuming that uh, the agency's FY20 budget assumes zero new revenue coming from this research? Uh That would be true because there is no mechanism to enable revenues to right. come from this fee well, source at this time. If it's time. adopted and if it goes into effect on July 1, it will need a revenue estimate. Okay. That revenue estimate could be zero. Yep. That would be fine. Okay. And if it was zero and you actually put anything into effect in FY20, that would be okay because the revenue would just go to the T fund bottom line. Okay. All right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I believe all of you received a letter from the Public Utility Commission with their sort of recommendation on the legislative fix to how you take the non-distribution utility electric vehicle charging stations out of the regulatory scheme and it has some information in there about standards that are being developed by NIST that could be used by the Ways and Measures Department but they're not finalized yet. If you don't have a copy of that letter we can certainly make sure that you do. I don't recall seeing it but it looks like Barbara does. I, well I'm searching. <laughs> we'll see That's that okay. yeah, right. Yeah. Gary, do you recall saying? Well, yes, I saw that. I read it uh, with, with great interest. I'm wondering, is uh, our friends on either the Senate or House Energy Committees taking that up already, or is, or is that language just been emailed to? No bills, to my knowledge, have been introduced on this. If I haven't asked to work on it, I'm sorry. Oh, I can respond. Yeah. Michelle. Um, so we are probably in our final day or so of communications with the Public Utility Commission relative to that letter and um, sort of having them bless us bringing that language to you for inclusion in the T-bill. So I'm hoping that um, within the next couple of days I'll have a draft of language that implements the PUC recommendation. Um, they didn't feel as though the Public Utility Commission needed to uh, take over that piece on their own. They were fine with it going forward legislatively as indicated in their letter. Uh, and so we are just going to take their draft and, and, and create the findings and bring that to you hopefully early next week. Um, and I think I told the committee that I have put in a request for third party charging. Just so it knows. 
so that it doesn't have to be a distribution utility that charges, but it can be people who own the oh, infrastructure. Okay. You think the amount to make money? Do you foresee that we could actually have competition like we do with gasoline sales? Someday, yeah. We have very low volume right now. Yeah. So I think eventually the market forces will take over. Um, one of the things to consider is that everyone who can, which is about you know, most, the vast majority of uh, EV drivers are going to charge at home. Some people yeah. can't because their wiring doesn't support it or they live in multi-unit dwellings that aren't equipped with that kind of infrastructure. But people who can will charge at home um, so there won't be as many um, stations for EV yeah. charging as there are for gasoline, but that'll work itself out over yeah. time. And every home could charge at level one. Right. Yes. Even if you're in a court of living in a window. Yeah, but with the modern electric vehicles, it's not going to really get you very far because it's so slow. Well, is, is that going to change? Level one will become yeah. obsolete? Yeah, really? because I mean, you're not going to, it's just not going to get you anywhere. These vehicles are going to have an enormous draw when they charge. I mean, it's going to be like half a big box store or something to plug one of these things in. And, uh, you, you know, trying to, to stick your uh, yeah, car in a wall plug is, you know. You, that's because the range is, is going to be. Yes. Yeah. So they have a 200 mile range. They're coming out with 400 mile range now. I mean, it's going to, uh, Tesla's working on a 500 mile range Roadster. And those cars cannot charge over 12 hours alone? Uh, they could, but it's still going to be probably a drop in the bucket because these batteries are going to have absolutely enormous capacity. No, what, what I'm getting at is uh, I'm hoping that the person, regardless of the range of their car, can always plug into a 120 volt outlet and they may have to charge it for 12 hours. Or, or days, more realistically. Okay, so when the range gets up yeah. in the hundreds, yeah. it's more than 12 hours. Absolutely, yeah. With the level one. With a level one. But they'll have level two. So yeah. Yeah. every house can come at a level two or you do you have to have an electrician for that circuit. Yeah, some houses might might not have the wiring to support it. It just I don't know a lot about it, but um, it, 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 the house just won't have that capacity in some older homes. Well, maybe do you know what the wattage is? I can't remember. So that's the voltage. The water is determines that's the power. So, but I would think that almost every house could come with that. Yeah. No house has three phase four eighty, which I just learned is what you need. Right. Yeah. Most level houses three. could use level two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Frank. So um, I just wanted to. Because when you use words like enormous, so uh, <laughs> Beck and I, for instance, are, are familiar with EVs. We've driven a few different yeah. models, and we, our friends at work have them, and we drive them frequently. So What did he say was enormous? So, well, he was talking about 400, 400 mile range okay. is enormous. And so the, the draw. Was, the draw, yeah, yeah the draw yeah. The draw can be enormous. But what, but when you just put it, think about like the capacities of the batteries are like in the 10 to 20 kilowatt hour range. And that's about what like my house, which is a pretty efficient single family home, uses in a whole day is what it takes to charge up the bolt, for instance, to go 250 miles. So just to give you a sense of the scale, because when you say it's enormous, it is a very big draw, but it doesn't it's not that big when you compare it to like a dryer, for instance. It's not a it's not a huge it's not such an enormous draw that I don't want people to, to be left with the impression if you're not familiar with these vehicles of it being like, oh, you know, or, or like when you said big box store, I was like, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's well, might talking, be a little hyperbole. <laughs> well, I don't know. You're talking about today's electric vehicles, and that they are going to increase in capacity. But there doesn't seem to be any concern about available electricity to power these things. So there's going to have to be some rate design and things like that, so people are encouraged to charge at certain times. and. Well, I'm, I'm actually concerned about that. One reason we're having Riley in. Yeah. I mean, because if, if we're going to be heating much of Vermont with air source heat pumps and yeah. driving electric cars, right. we obviously do not have that purchase online today. That would be uh, I, no, well, Riley can tell you more about that. No, we definitely don't. Yeah. We wouldn't, even if we could. 
but a lot can be done with time of use rates, and Riley's really the expert. He'll yeah. fill you in on that. Okay. It's just a, the enormous a part of it. Is it because <laughs> that's, that's the last big word I'm going to use. <laughs> plug it in, and it has to be plugged in for 12 hours or more, though. Or there's different levels. That that's the okay. slow one, and this one okay. in the middle is about half that time. But I mean, if you're at home, it would be the slower one, or then you have. You can do a six-hour charge. A six-hour. You have two options two. at home: level one and level two. Okay. On that one, you need an electrician to come. Put in the 240 volt circuit for just that. A dedicated circuit. It's nothing you would, you, if your closed barrier circuit's about the same size, right. but you couldn't use that circuit. Okay, thank you. And, uh, we'll have to move on in a sec, but just to put this in context, the, the grand s scheme here, the sort of the big idea, is that all this extra load from electric vehicles and heating is actually going to create downward rate pressure because the utilities are going to be able to sell that much more electricity. Um, so it's it's all sort of win-win if it if it works. I just want to make sure there's going to be the electricity. Right. Brian, it, it's not that we'll find this out as we go along, but I have concerns about the grid. Mm -hmm. Because the grid, ten years ago, was in serious need of being rebuilt, and I'm not sure what progress that is, and I don't expect you to. I'm going to pitch somebody. all this to Riley and. Yeah. Uh, so he can get on the ask. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he's coming. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. All right. Well, more yeah. from there. Mm -hmm. I got a simple question. Uh, yeah. So what would be the cost to a consumer of a level two six-hour charge? Uh, I don't know. Do you know the answer to that? So, I'm afraid I don't. Yeah, I don't know exactly. I personally have, um, as a Green Mountain Power customer, they cover the cost of the charger for me. So there's an incentive program. But it was going to cost me $600, and I had a lovely electrician uh, put it in for me at cost. But, but what is it? But that's the charger. charger. Oh, oh, to charge it. So I, just a regular, you know. Yeah. So you plug it in, yeah. it's just a so cost I, for one try. Green Mountain Power has a program where it's a capped amount, so I have unlimited charging for $29.99 a month. And if I wasn't doing the program, I would probably be paying $100 to $150 a month to charge. So, and at least that's, that's what, that's it. Are you the only charging off peak hours? No, I can charge at all hours. Okay. I mean, I'm subject to events, like, you know, I'm, I, I can't, the, the from my understanding, if there's an event, I get a little email from Green Mountain Power, and I don't charge during usually a short window of time, but it's what never an event. From my understanding. High usage time, yeah. Oh, okay. Like I get a little email that's okay. like, we're doing something. Okay. And I understand that uh, Village Electric just came out with a, a new rate that mm -hmm. is comparable to like 60 cents a gallon. So it's substantially less. That Which, one may be just for. Uh, it, pro it should yeah. be just yeah. off peak hours. It's I a great thing to be doing it off peak hours. So okay. uh, I find your comment about you got this special rate of 30 bucks a month versus you said it would be 150. I mean, that seems like a, so that's just a come along that the company is giving you. Okay. In reality, it's going to cost customers 150. I mean, that's, uh, that's comparable to what I was paying, like 500 to... Seven hundred fifty a month in gas. No, that's, you don't use yeah. the word. Yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> the average guy does it. Yes, I'm a high <laughs> use driver. Check is in that Just thing. to be clear, I yeah, I'm a very high use driver. Um, so that just so you know, it it is far far less than what I was paying in gas. So what do you know about that, Mary? Well, the only thing I I think um, all these utilities because I know they were working on it before I even left Rolls Royce to hire them years ago that um, time of use rates are definitely coming down and the cost the um, like the hourly rate um, at night for the utility pays is really 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 low where during the day it really creeps up so if you charge your car at night you're using that really cheap power and um, as long as you know they can figure out the time of use rates then you know well, it won't be a, an incentive it'll just be part of the rate. Robert. Well, I just have to say that my reaction when it, we're talking about a public service department um, asset, which let me see, is, and that I'm glad that you're getting the benefit, but it means that someone else is paying that other $120 that you're not, and, and it's spread out. Yeah, and so that's just the piece that 
that's the whole point about it being a public service utility. It, it, everyone pays for the whole cost of the system. So we, we need to not lose sight of that. And, it's the, and it may be worth it because you we're buying you know we're we're buying something as a society I presume that you know we're looking for making a change and an impact but there's a cost yeah and then it's it's um, Mike's question again the second question which was uh, well what I took from that question is um, how much do we do this when do we stop when do we phase it out when is it worth it when is it not and that's that's the big question. Um, I guess I would um, encourage you to bring that question to Riley on Friday yeah. because um, part of what my understanding of this is is that the utilities are you know contracted to buy a set amount of electricity regardless yes and um, right now they're not able to necessarily fully optimize the electricity they have available to sell and so all consumers are paying more for the kilowatt hours that are contracted versus if we had more people purchasing um, electricity, even if it's not peak rates at that you know, favorable price, which is where they want it to be because then they're not purchasing the spike cost of electricity from another market beyond the contracted one. And, and I'm sure there are people in the room that are like, I can't believe she's saying these things because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but there are people that know more about this than I do. But um, the point being that um, that this could actually become a more favorable um, matter in terms of all rate payers to have more people purchasing the power that we already have to contract to use that might not be um, as optimally used as it is today. And so Riley, will, who's the expert, will really get into that. But please make sure to, to talk to them about that. Yeah. Mike. So uh, this could be Michelle or Dan, but I, I think that we, we got into a place where we were really talking about the, the, the benefits or the potential pitfalls of electrification. And could you just bring us out to the 30,000 foot level before we before we go away here? Because you know, in the work that I do in my day job, in, in the comprehensive energy plan, and a lot of things that are going on in this whole building, our entire state is moving toward electrification for a whole number of reasons. And the um, some of the, the sort of incentives, while we're down at the like 2,000 or 3,000 car uh, of that, are full, that are EVs, are gonna have to be very different as we move forward. Yeah. And, and I love that we're like having that conversation about what it looks like, but what, um, what key performance indicators what things are we looking at to get back to Molly's earlier question, my earlier question? We're here in 2019. We've got these goals in 2025. We're we're talking about the you know okay uh, an incentive that Green Mountain Power has of 30 bucks a month of unlimited charging to try to get people in the habit right like that we talked about being somebody said Dave I think said I represent Potter there was a comma that. Obviously, those things are going to change as we get to adoption. Could you, could you maybe put a finer point on the kind of big transformation that's happened? Because I think in the past, this committee, in, when I was here a few years ago, was not really focused on being part of that energy transformation. And it's like, I'm so excited about this conversation. So maybe you could just talk about what this means in, the, in, the, in that context. So. Um I'll take that first, and I think this is going to be an ongoing conversation that we have. Um, I think in terms of the metrics, you know, we have a sort of point in the sand with the, um, and I say sand because it is a, a changing environment with the comprehensive energy plan and those goals and what we need to do. You know, I, I don't have it laid out for you. Every year we need to do X, Y, and Z because right now we're not even meeting those goals and we haven't had the tools that we needed. And so I think last year was the first time in, that I've seen in the past four years where the legislature really started about talking about how what are the tools we're going to need and there's a lot of small tools that we need right now there's some big tools that we need getting back to the point of the transportation fund impacts you know right now electric vehicles on my back of the envelope calculation last year have about a two hundred thousand dollar impact on the transportation fund as opposed to fuel efficiency, which is about a $2.5 million impact on the transportation fund in recent years. So 
um, there are a lot of things in play that we need to get off the ground to move the dial on these sort of suite of public policy matters we want to address. And we're going to have to keep revisiting these, as you mentioned, as the, as the whole process matures and as we get closer to meeting the goals, as the market sort of dictates how quickly we meet those goals in some respects. Um, and so I can come back to you and we can, you know, it's, it's a collaboration between public service and Agency of uh, Transportation and Natural Resources. We can come back to you with some suggested metrics and, and framework. We don't have those today. Dan's going to talk a little bit more about the Comprehensive Energy Plan and some of the other efforts. Um, but I think, you know, we're not going to get to it all this morning. Um, but great questions and I've taken a lot of notes so we can continue this dialogue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dan, we should move into yep. your Keep it moving here We're in the, the, the second thing. half. Yep. All right, so um, I, maybe this session will, will help uh, answer some of these questions. Um, the, the first couple items I talked about were actually, I thought, going to be kind of discreet, and but they led to a lot of spinoffs. <laughs> and these next two really aren't very <laughs> discreet boxes, so the conversation could go anywhere. So let me just try to set the table. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the Comprehensive Energy Plan and the Vermont um, Climate Action Commission and the nexus to transportation. And then the uh, last subject I wanted to talk about that's on the agenda is um, the charging network in Vermont and the VW program. So still quite a bit to do. So on the Comprehensive Energy Plan, it's required by uh, Vermont law and statute. Uh, the Public Service Department updated the plan in 2016. Updates are required every six years, so the next update is due by 2022. Uh, they may do it sooner. I think there are probably pieces in there that are already obsolescent because things are changing so fast. Um, the uh, CEP, Comprehensive Energy Plan, advances multiple policies to move the state toward renewable energy and establishes a, an overall target of 90 percent renewable energy over all sectors by 2050 uh, along with interim milestones and sector specific goals and i should just say i don't have all the details about this but these uh, numbers weren't just pulled out of the air it's a sort of a reasonable estimate of where we need to be to avoid the worst effects of climate change and of course there are uh, enormous co-benefits to renewable uh, transportation, including uh, clean air, energy independence, and so forth. Um, uh, as the CEP points out, the transportation sector is the state's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, responsible for almost half of the state's total. Uh, the transportation sector also emits more greenhouse gas than any other um, sector on the national <laughs> level, and we're probably going to see even uh, the transportation sector occupy an even larger slice of the pie as the um, distribution utility uh, sector gets cleaned up. So um, while we are seeing uh, cleaner sources of electrical power, uh, motor vehicle emissions, the greenhouse gases have been increasing with population and economic growth as of 2015. And remember I said there's a little lag in some of the data. Uh, but as, uh, as of 2015, greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont were 16% above 1990 levels and 10% above 2013 levels. So we're actually moving in the opposite direction from where we want to. The CEP, as we've discussed, establishes a goal of 10% renewable transportation by 2025 and at least 80% by 2050. Uh, and to get there, the CEP recommends four main strategies. Uh, one is smart growth, also known as smart land use planning, to advance the state's overall planning goal of compact centers uh, surrounded by rural countryside. The second main strategy is transportation demand management, which basically means moving people away from single occupancy vehicles through alternatives like uh, uh, bicycle and pedestrian um, uh, transportation, public transit, carpooling, and, and telework. A uh, third strategy, uh, using renewable biofuels to power heavy-duty vehicles. And then the last strategy is increasing the efficiency of light-duty vehicles 
while rapidly moving toward an electrified passenger vehicle fleet. Uh, I'm going to concentrate mostly on the uh, electric vehicle piece. Um, I'll just say briefly that uh, using biofuels to power heavy duty, duty vehicles does not seem to be making much progress in Vermont and the rapid advances in electric vehicle technology do raise some questions about whether biofuels represent a needed interim technology or whether policy initi initiatives should focus on moving the heavy duty fleet directly to battery technology. Uh, certain biofuels like ethanol, which is already required by law, uh, do not re reduce greenhouse gases when you consider the life cycle of the fuel and they have very harmful side effects like water pollution. Uh, because of the increased land going into corn production. Uh, smart growth is a very complicated subject, and suffice it to say that about three quarters of the development in Vermont does not go through Act 250, and a patchwork of local planning, zoning, and enforcement does not always capture the rest. The extensive discussions around Act 250 that can be expected in the legislature this year and probably next year uh, will likely address some of those land use challenges. Um, with regard to transportation demand management, uh, VTrans has been working on that for decades. Um, uh, VTrans increasingly incorporates complete streets, um, including bike ped facilities into its projects, uh, and puts significant resources into passenger and freight rail and public transit. Uh, in addition, VTrans runs the Go Vermont commuter program and funds a robust network of state and municipal park and ride facilities. Uh, these efforts remain important and worthwhile, uh, but will not translate into rapid progress toward meeting Vermont's targets for renewable transportation. The electrification of passenger vehicles can potentially move the states uh, towards sustainable transportation faster than any other strategy, uh, although it should be used in combination with the rest. Uh, to accelerate vehicle electrification, VTrans and other Vermont agencies are working on several policy initiatives, uh, many of which we're talking about today. The CEP's goal of 10% renewable um, transportation by 2025 translates into about 50,000 EVs or 10% of the passenger fleet on the road by that date. And as of right now, Vermont has only about 2,600 EVs on the road. Uh, and EVs are just 3.5% of new passenger vehicle registrations. So when you think about um, the 96.5% um, of people who are still buying combustion vehicles, uh, those cars have an average lifespan of something like 12 to 14 years. So this is gonna take a while to turn around and the quicker we can get people into the EV market, the better. Um, So we're not yet on track to meet our transportation. Yep. Question, I know. Question. I know, yeah. Yeah, I know we're Fine. talking about electric vehicles, uh -huh. but when you're talking about the gas combustion, yes. Uh, have they made strides towards reducing their emissions as well? Though the, the newer models are yep. much more. They're more fuel efficient, but um, that's not going to affect greenhouse gas emissions. Except for there's less fuel use, so I think you get fewer greenhouse gas emissions as a result of that, um, but the, um, the other uh, emission control devices aren't going to affect greenhouse gases, your okay. catalytic converter and that kind of thing. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. All right, so um, as I mentioned earlier, VTrans contracts with the University of Vermont Transportation Research Center to biennially issue, uh, I think it would be bi biennially issue, yeah, a, a transportation energy profile and that provides greater details about the progress Vermont is making toward the transportation, uh, climate, and energy goals of the CEP. The motor vehicle market is undergoing a dramatic shift toward electrification. And while it is safe to say that transportation electrification is coming fast, it's also safe to say that it's not coming fast enough to meet the science-based transportation, climate, and energy targets. Uh, that Vermont and many other jurisdictions have established. Public policy is needed to move the uh, market until market forces can take over. Meeting Vermont's transportation electrification targets will make Vermont attractive to employers, workers, and tourists, and will help grow Vermont's economy by keeping um, 
uh, transportation energy expenditures in state. And even though Vermont is falling short of its EV goals, Vermont is near the head of the class on a per capita basis uh, when it comes to EV ownership compared to other states. So it's someplace like number five, possibly. Um, so um, that was the CEP. If I could pause for questions here, or we'll go right into the Climate Action Commission. Questions on So the Climate Action Commission recognized that transportation is the leading energy driver in the state and made numerous recommendations for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, these recommendations fall into two main categories. Uh, one is continued work on transportation demand management, which I discussed briefly a few minutes ago. And the other main strategy is accelerating the pace of vehicle electrification. So with regard to vehicle electrification, the report made 12 specific recommendations, and I'll, I'll just um, list those. Um, provide a state-funded EV purchase incentive uh, that applies to new and used EVs with incentives targeting rural and low to moderate income Vermonters. That was recommendation eight. Recommendation nine, strengthen the used EV market. Number 10, work with auto dealers to collect and publicize deals on EVs and use uh, the Drive Electric Vermont website to generate sales leads for EV dealers. Uh, recommendation 11, implement the recommendations of VTrans' fast charging corridor study to provide uh, DCFC, uh, direct current fast charging within 30 miles of all Vermonters. Uh, number 12, develop and execute a strategy for deployment of VW settlement funds. I have the fastest charging within 30 miles. Yes, we do. And I'm going to flesh that out a bit later. Can we drop, because we actually closed the screen on, on a document that Oh, yeah, it's not really saying. terribly Could you relevant. pull up, because you're... Um, what do I do, just press home here? Maybe Maddie can help get the, uh, the document she sent. Because I'm, I'm able to follow, but I don't think... Many people um, here are following the Yeah, I don't know if I have um, a well, handout specifically on that. We've got exactly what you're reading. Yeah, you oh, okay. It's on our Okay. It's on our agenda. Yeah. Okay, so you just want that up. Well, just it just makes sense. It, okay, it helps people sure. follow a little better, right. I think. Yeah, all right. So, Thank you, uh, Matt. Thank you, please. Page seven. Right. Well, exactly. Headers at the top here. Yeah. Oh, funny, the headers yeah, cut off. Might as well. Yeah, yeah, one more. Keep going up. It's about where we are. Things get a little complicated. Yeah. Sir. Good. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So just carrying on here with the recommendations of the Climate Action Commission relating to electric vehicles, um, conduct research and analysis needed to support the PUC investigation of issues uh, relating to the charging of EVs under uh, Act 58 of uh, 2018. Um, do you want me to scroll this up as I go? Or? Okay. All right. If some of that, I'll just read it off here. Um, 14, leverage and enhance DEVs drive electric Vermont to maximize the impact of education and outreach campaigns and stakeholder engagement to build awareness and encourage purchase consideration for EVs. 15, implement ride and drive events to give uh, Vermonters a chance to test drive EVs. 16, work collaboratively with auto dealers on developing and deploying strategies to effectively engage customers who are interested in purchasing an EV and to make the sale. Uh, 17, make EVs available through traditional rental, uh, car rental, car share, taxi, and ride hailing services. Uh, 18, use uh, EV settlement funds to jumpstart a transition from diesel to electric transit and school buses. And 19, investigate and utilize grant funding and finance strategies to help overcome the high upfront costs of electric transit buses. So uh, VTrans and the other agencies are already at work on several of these strategies. Some of them, especially um, uh, the public education and outreach type pieces are gonna uh, take a little longer because they involve contracting and budgeting. But a number of these incentives we're um, already working on. So for example, uh, we, we just discussed the um, basic structure of an incentive program for inclusion in this year's transportation bill. Um, a grant 
program for charging infrastructure, which we call the VW EVSC grant program, is also in place and underway, and I'm going to talk to you more about that um, in a little while. Uh, also, a is leading an interagency team to administer the rest of Vermont's share of um, the national VW settlement funds and is starting that effort with a pilot project for electric transit and school buses. Um, a &R is now committed to using all the national VW settlement funds on vehicle electrification and none on replacing or converting older diesel vehicles with newer diesel technology. So the whole $18.7 million is going to go into electrification. Um, so Deputy Commissioner Riley Allen from Public Service is going to talk to you more about the PUC workshop on Friday. He'll cover um, rate design and strategies for addressing demand charges uh, at fast charging stations. Uh, demand charges is, is the charge that the utility assesses for having electricity on hand. So even if you have a relatively quiet operation, say you've got a factory and you just uh, fire up your um, conveyor belts and assembly line once a month, you're going to get hit with a very heavy demand charge because the utility has to have that energy available for when you need it. And that's proving to be a, a big challenge in, in DC fast charging. And the PUC is going to look at that. Um, Um, yeah. Sorry, Dan. Yeah. Look at Gardner. Could you ask Riley when he comes if he's able to bring an engineer, much fun to you with Okay. Do you see what I mean? I doubt it. I think he's an economist. Okay. So that would be great. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Chair, have you, have you warned everybody that you're an electrician? Yeah. I think <laughs> you got <laughs> Well, you're in the right so place. I'm tired. Don't call me in the <laughs> <laughs> license from my house. <laughs> so that uh, just uh, before moving along, that uh, we do have an interagency team, including VTrans, that's working with um, the PUC and other stakeholders on their uh, electric vehicle um, investigation. Um, so um, VTrans is uh, also using um, additional federal funding, the, there's a, a NOLO grant program to bring two full-size electric transit buses and two cutaway electric shuttle buses to Vermont. This is outside the VW pilot bus project. These are the two GMTs? Yes, two GMTs and then there'll be two uh, shuttle buses in Montpelier. No GMTs. <laughs> two buses. It's Green Mountain Transit. Right, two GMT buses and two cutaway shuttles. All right. Um, and the, the uh, GMT buses should be here, I think, in the summertime, and the shuttles maybe a year later. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's a cutaway shuttle? It, it's what you see buzzing around Montpelier and that stops by the Capitol in the short buses. It's just a small bus. Yeah. 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 It's called a cutaway shunt? Shuttle. 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 Is cutaway right? Yes, it yes. is. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I want to say cutaway. <coughs> That's not right. Um, so um, just in its uh, preliminary report, the Climate Action Commission recommended the market-based cap and invest system for the transportation sector. And uh, Governor Scott has now committed Vermont to work with other jurisdictions in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states uh, of the United States through the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is run by Georgetown University. And uh, the idea is to develop a cap and invest program by the end of this year at which time the uh, states involved in this effort will decide whether they actually want to adopt the policy that's developed. Yeah. Um, so if it's adopted and, um, or if it's created by the end of this year, when would it actually go online? And, and do you know that yet? We don't know that. The first milestone is to come up with a program that makes the most sense and then the states have to evaluate it and decide if and when they're going to adopt it. So it'll work like Reggie, but it's not Reggie. Correct. Something like that. But I think all options are open at this point, and that process is starting to ramp up. Reggie. Uh, uh, Reggie. Regional greenhouse gas, gas initiative. initiative. And that's used for the power sector and industry. 
So right, the idea would be to extend that or something like that to kind transportation. Of use that model. Possibly. Okay, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. I think that's the thinking, but we just don't know how it's going to play out. So um, uh, just to wrap up that part of my testimony, uh, vehicle electrification is a key strategy for meeting the state's climate and energy goals for transportation. And the state is not on target to meet these goals, but just we're not necessarily going to proceed in a, a linear fashion either. So it is possible that even though we're not on target now, we could get to a point of exponential growth and make up for lost time. And this will probably, I'm not sure we're going to meet our targets, but I do anticipate sort of snowballing growth in the electric vehicle market. It's what we've been seeing so far. And um, in the next few years, probably we're going to start seeing more um, vehicle models that are suitable for uh, wintry off-road type applications and you know various other sort of models that will appeal to a broader audience. And we're going to get to cost parity in uh, several years at the most. Yes. So what will those? How will those models be different that you just described? Well, we're going to get we're going to see pickup trucks uh, and SUVs with all-wheel drive and high ground clearance. And you know, right now we're seeing sort of the low-slung Teslas and uh, things like that, and they, they probably work fine. You'd have to talk to a, a driver. Um, the electric vehicles tend to be heavy because of the batteries, and they have a nice distributed weight. Uh, so uh, as far as I know, if you put a pair of snow tires on, you're doing okay. But um, a lot of people like to drive. Um, uh, SUVs and, and pickup trucks, and we're going to start seeing more of that. How far out is that? A couple of years? Probably a couple of years. Um, Ford says they're going to come out with an F-150 electric version, but they don't have a, a date on that. Um, there's a new company called Rivian that's got some really interesting vehicles, uh, 14 and a half inches of ground, ground clearance, all-wheel drive, 400-plus um, miles of range. Um, Zero not hybrid. No, no, pure, pure battery electric vehicles. Uh, zero to sixty in three seconds, um, <laughs> and a, a lot of really interesting design features. And I think they're saying the Rivian right now is going to cost about sixty-nine thousand dollars. So that's pretty expensive, but not really compared to a souped-up, uh, you know, sort of super-duty pickup truck. So uh, we're going to start seeing a lot of changes. Any questions before I move into the last section on the sheet? Yeah, just a quick one on that your last point. Um, so we learned from Barbara Donovan over transit that uh, they wanted to get um, long lasting power, a good battery warranty or nervous about the life of the battery. So spending an extra two hundred thousand dollars just for just for that warranty. For the GMT buses. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's brought the cost of the bus from seven hundred thousand to nine hundred thousand. And the replacement diesel is about half a million. So that four hundred thousand dollars was actually made up according to DEIC. You guys had um, analyzed this on life cycle cost. The, the, the vehicles will actually cost about the same. Right. And that how does that analysis look uh, for passenger automobiles? Um, I think right now uh, it depends on what. Uh, I guess what we have to do is compare sort of comparable vehicles, you know, the luxury electric vehicle, the luxury combustion vehicles, and so forth, um, to, to try to figure out, you know, just what your life cycle cost would be. I, I believe overall it's cheaper to, it's already cheaper to um, uh, get into the electric vehicle market over the life cycle of the vehicle. Um, and eventually, we're going to start seeing upfront cost parity. Drive electric much cheaper. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to point out that Drive Electric Vermont has a very comprehensive website that I believe addresses that question. Um, you know, if, you, if you really wanted more detail, we'd be happy to bring in somebody to testify on that. Um, if, if, you, if you can't find the information you're looking for, I don't know if they're on our list. Drive Electric Vermont. Drive Electric Vermont. I can get uh, Maddie the contact information. They, they've been a great resource and they've done a lot of the public outreach to date and keeping uh, everybody organized towards this mission. 
Yeah, we'll probably rely on Drive Electric Vermont for um, some of the education and outreach goals and the um, Climate Commission's recommendations. Um, we have to go through state procurement, so it could be someone else, but they're, they've been a pretty good partner. Ready to move along? I think so. Okay. I think we're more or less on track. So uh, getting into the um, next uh, last uh, big section here, uh, it's about the EV charging network in Vermont. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the state goals for the highway corridor fast charging network and then also the VW uh, grant program. Um, so. Um, in 2017, uh, VTrans consultants completed a report on uh, electric vehicle DC fast charging on Vermont highway corridors. Um, I might have a copy of it here for if anyone wants to take a look. I can pass this around the room. And it's also available online. Pretty much everything I've referred to today is available online. Um, so the report identified seven sites that, if equipped with fast charging, would put a publicly available fast charger within 30 miles of nearly every address in Vermont and form the backbone of a statewide highway corridor fast charging network. Uh, each of the report's proposed sites is near an interstate exchange and was screened for proximate uh, phase three power. You have to have phase three power to run a DC fast charger. Um, and that actually turns out to be a significant limiting factor on where these things can be located. So just for your information, when you say phase three, that actually sounds like something else entirely. Okay. It's three phase. Three phase. Okay. Three phase. All right. Get that. <laughs> this is why I warned you. <laughs> well, it's good to know, actually. No, it really sounds like you're talking about phases of, of, yeah, yeah. of, of plan. Right. Three phase. Yeah. Um, so three phase power is a, a limiting factor, but the, the report did screen the sites for that. Uh, also uh, site amenities, 24-7 uh, access and willing site hosts. So the, the um, Du Bois and King report that's going around didn't just look at uh, sort of general geographic sites, it, it looked at specific properties um, to locate um, these facilities. So there was a multi-agency team again with uh, uh, A&R in the lead, uh, which identified a handful of additional general locations along uh, major Vermont highways for fast charging development. And there's another handout that looks like this. Do you want me to try to get that on the screen? Okay, okay. you got that. So this is the basic Du Bois and King map with a few other places added, uh, the Western Corridor and Looks like Route 9 at the south, uh, a couple places like that. Um, yeah. uh, based off this map, is mm -hmm. the phase, uh, yeah, you got me. The level three charger in White River Junction, is that an additional charger recommendation on top of what you're suggesting? Be that would be the one I mentioned system? earlier. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah that would be to charge uh, uh, VTrans's fleet. And so that's the kind of thing that we could make available to the public um, or to employees, um, you know, if we get the authorization to charge for charging. Um, but but the Du Bois and King study did make its own recommendation for a site at White River Junction. And there's a place, there's a business there, I can't remember the name of now, it's something like the Carriage House or something like that, it's not quite right. But there was a, a place uh, that, that's willing to uh, host the charger. And White River is, of course, a, a great spot because of the intersection of the interstates. Okay, so yeah. you are suggesting two level three chargers within, the, within my town. Yes. Just to be, I'm sorry. But, okay. Yes, but one of them would be for VTrans's and fleet. We'll, okay. And so we don't want, I can't make any promises on where that is, whether it's going to be behind the fence or not. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, White River is a prime location, and that certainly uh, a, a place that needs to be populated with fast charging. Yeah, we have no, one. No question. So. You have one already. Yeah. A fast charger. Yeah, the hotel. Okay. The agency clearly yeah. studied. We were all from this committee was first born. <laughs> <laughs> Mom. Uh, what is what is Chatham? 
Uh, where, oh, is that on the map? Yeah. <coughs> okay. It's so the location of, a, of something. I yeah. Mean, I see in Brattleboro there's a the, Tesla, and I know that. Well, those are different kinds of chargers. And they already exist because we have a couple municipal. Well, as the chair said, you, you have level one charging, which is a plug in your wall. You got level two charging, which is a specific device with a specific kind of outlet that fits into your car. And that's all universal. They fit all electric vehicles. Unfortunately, with the um, DC fast charging, there are different kinds of plugs. One of them is Chatamo, uh, one of them is the SAE Combo, and the other is the Tesla. And this is obviously creating a problem that they're not all intercompatible. And you would think that you could just have a conversion device, like if you go to England, you know, and you want to plug in your phone, but it, for some reason it's not that easy. Um, I don't. The, the Chatamo vehicles tend to be from Asia, and the um, SAE Combo electric vehicles tend to be from North America and Europe. Uh, so, and then Tesla's got their own system. I think Tesla does have some converters that can be used as some of the other chargers. Um, but I think if you if you have a, a SAE Combo plug, you can't use Chatamo and vice versa. If I got that correct, so. Um, long answer to your question. Okay. Yeah, it, it's all enough to make your head spin. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, just that aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I come from the old world kind of. And I, I like, I see when I come to the legislature, the two charging stations down here on the mm -hmm. end of the yep. Capitol. And, uh, I visualize in my mind, like, if all the legislators had electric vehicles, how many of those stations, you know, I come from Rutland up over the mountain, I probably have to charge here. It's not like I'm going home, you right. know? And it just seems like there would be a, a lot, a lot more need for uh, chargeability across the state than and I'm just talking about a yeah. legislator says, so yeah. what, uh, maybe 100 cars come in here? And yeah. if you took all the rest of Montpelier, of course, many of those people are charging at home. I right. understand that. But, uh, and then I visualize gas stations in my mind. But you go to the gas station, you're there for maybe a couple minutes filling up. It's a lot different when you've got to plug in and charge for a while. It just seems like there's an awful long ways to go. No, maybe he can talk about that to make me feel better. Well, I will. Okay. Um, and there is there is a long way to go. Um, but as you said, most people will charge at home, which is very convenient. For folks like you who are going to be staying overnight, you're going to need another option. Um, probably you're going to be able to take advantage of a level two charger, which are for longer dwell times. Um, so eventually we're going to see those um, maybe along the streets, uh, at hotels, um, restaurants, other places where you can expect to just park your vehicle for a while, park and rides and things like that. And if you need a quick charge, you'll have to go to a, a fast charger. How, how would you, like, just take Capitol Plaza and all those cars parked out back there? Yeah. How would they all charge? I, you know. Well, they've actually um, submitted a um, uh, an application for funding under the uh, VWEBSE grant program for the, the new construction that's going to happen there. Uh, for a bank of level two chargers in the parking garage. What's a bank? Like, like a whole row, and I, don't, I can't remember how many there they've asked for, it, and I can't remember if they were funded, which isn't totally public yet anyway. Um, but uh, you know that's how it's going to be. The parking garages will have some level twos, and um, and the, the fast charging is eventually going to be very fast. Um, so if might be 40 minutes now or something like that, but it, you know, it's going to be 20 minutes, maybe five minutes even to just get this super quick, high power charge. And some of it might even be able to uh, happen wirelessly, so you don't even have to get out of your car. Um, so let's see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, so are they working on a solar charger? Okay. Charge all the time. Pro probably, this is going to be a, a 
ways away when we start getting to off-grid and micro-grid type electrical systems uh, or distribution systems. But yes, eventually you'll have solar power uh, that will then need to be stored probably in a battery and then that could be used to charge. And some people might even be able to do that at home as well. No, but it would, I mean, right on the vehicle itself. Oh, that, I don't know about that. You might need uh, more panels than um, could fit to charge something that powerful. They were, I thought they were working on these little tiny panels. Well, I, I don't know anything more about that. I think it's going to be a ways off, but that I uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt. So. All of these charging yeah. st stations sounds ugly aesthetically. Well, they're a lot cleaner than gas and filling stations. No spills. There's one station, and there's going to be a slew of charging stations. How kind of you've seen them out here? This this part of it. Nice. There are electric cars that run just on the solar side, but it's very small. Doesn't go very fast. Calls me quiet. ones that were around, at least I'm seeing them in, in what was uh, like 20, 30 years ago, but they didn't even have batteries in them. They just got out there and ran at the sun. So you could, you could be charging a battery, but they, they would be small, and, and they were, the collectors were rather large. So this vehicle would just look like a big solar system going up. Um, was this, uh, no, my fact, I should have but did you want to follow up on, on that? Well, I just wanted to speak to this issue of the proliferation of charging stations and where are we going to need them, et cetera. I think part of what we're trying to convey is the, the, the um, size of the battery and the distance that a car can travel on a charge is increasing. So if you have an all-electric vehicle that gets 400 miles on a charge, even if you are a representative potter who's coming from Rutland, you can probably get to to Montpelier and back, and then not have to charge again until you get home. Um, if you're somebody that's driving from Montreal down to Montpelier, and you want to make the round trip back or go to Boston, then you're probably going to want to, if you spend the night at the Capitol Plaza, look up over there and charge. Or if you like, a, or a salesperson driving around the area, you're going to want to charge overnight at the Capitol Plaza when you when you stop there. Or if you're just driving all the way through from Montreal to Boston, you may want to stop at you know Berlin exit and. and get a fast charge. So I think the way we think about how we gas up compared to how we're going to charge up is a very different sort of um, apples and oranges comparison. And so I think um, it's going to be important to um, help people understand the framing of this. We're not going to see charging stations, you know, on every block. Uh, it's not as though, you know, you're going to need them everywhere. Um, because the way we are going to fuel our vehicles is going to be very different in the future. That's a really good point. Um, uh, electricity is just, you have to get used to this. It's not a new system, of course. It's not an energy uh, source, but it's, uh, it's not like any other. And the electricity itself is actually not stored. It cannot be stored. It's not electricity, it's out of the battery. We're going to be doing more and more of electricity, and we've done a lot with it so far, but it doesn't sit, those transformers on poles, there's no electricity in there uh, until someone's using something. It's, um, it, again, it just can't be stored, so it's not like oil or gas in a tank. Utilities just have to have power ready for when we use it. Ready. And they always have to have a little more to make sure, because they don't know exactly how much we're going to use, especially on like, the peak of the day. So it's, it's, and so that, manifest, that difference is manifested in all these things. And it, it's just very, very different. The charging stations coming, there's no electricity in them. There's only electricity when someone plugs it in and it flows. And it flows, it doesn't flow. It doesn't sit, it, it, it never sits. <laughs> it's always moving at the speed of light. It's quite incredible. 
And the electric motor, I just have to say, is one of the greatest things we have ever invented, and invented like 150 years ago. Yeah, and it got invented in Vermont. Yeah. Branded. That's right. Yeah, um, we should be smart Vermonters. Yeah. You can't get away from them. <laughs> I have a question about the difference in cost between that 400 mile battery and that 150 mile battery that is you, that you're talking about. Yeah. What's the difference in cost? Well, it's really all about um, you know at this point the longer range batteries do cost more, and so the vehicles they are in cost more. Uh, but the prices are coming down because the battery technology isn't improving and there's also sort of a, a market scale in terms of, you know, when you have a new invention, everything costs a lot that you want to do with that new invention, but as, you know, you get more in production, you have more available, they cost less. It's a market issue. So um, I can't tell you dollars and cents wise. The Just remain <laughs> optimistic. I, I, I would say, like, yeah, between now and next year, keep your optimism up because they're coming. You know, it's, it's not a matter of, of uh, if it's a matter of when and it's on the immediate horizon. And Mary, and then I uh, this is a little off topic, but because we'll probably buy a full electric within the next couple of years, I just because the chairman feels free to go off topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a protocol like th these things are just out there? Like we have one at the bottom of um, you know as we come in on um, um, George Aiken Drive, um, like. Can you go up and unplug somebody else's once you know that? Um, yeah, there's certain customs and that kind of thing. Uh, probably what's going to happen with the um, uh, rate structure on these publicly available charging stations is that you're going to start to get charged extra if you overstay your charge. Um, so people will have an incentive to move. And there's a lot of software associated with charging. So you can, um, if you're at work, for example, and that um, all the level two charging stations are filled up. You can get uh, notified on your phone oh. when one of them is free. Uh -huh. um, so some things like that will be coming along yeah. too, that actually already exist. It's like sharing the microwave right there. <laughs> 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 you take somebody's food out. It's done. <laughs> well, going to the laundry <laughs> dryer. Yeah. <laughs> Just a, a life cycle of a battery, a length of time where you have to replace this. Do you know that 10 years or something? I'm thinking like it's that? 10 years, but yeah. I'm not sure in that area. It's around 10 yeah. years, I think. Okay, thank you. Mike, what are the D and K proposed stops on the Du Bois and King Mac? The green, octagonal. Yes, what are they? Yeah, what, what are they? Those are where Du Bois and King uh, found specific site hosts for fast charging stations. Uh, in locations that would um, get a fast charger within 30 miles of just about everyone in Vermont. There's a little bit in the northeast that's, that would be cut off. That's so in that, that's separate from the ones that are suggested as the, with the Red Star as the fast charging? Right. Uh, we thought that there would be some additional places that you know could really benefit. So, Thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, and just to follow up on Representative Potter's question about you know how much of uh, this equipment are we going to need, um, I'm just skipping ahead to the end here a little. You can play around on the uh, U.S. Department of Energy's Alternative Fuels Data Center uh, EV Pro Light projection tool. Um, it sounds like really hard to use, but it's not. You just go to their website, and um, it's down here in my presentation. Um, you can go to their website, and what I did um, for this talk today was to uh, just plug in 50,000 EVs, which is our 2025 goal, to see um, how much charging infrastructure we would need. And the EV ProLite projects that 190 um, DC fast charging stations will be necessary. Right now we have fewer than 30, and they're not strategically distributed. So um, that's a lot of fast charging. and. I didn't do the exercise with level two, but it'll allow that too, and it comes out to a couple of thousand, I think, level two chargers by 2025. So, so you know, a lot of it infrastructure. Um, so, is there a lot of yeah. people knocking at the door to build these things? I mean, it, it, it's are people seeing profit potential Not, and coming well, to you? Well, yeah. the emphasis on potential, um, I think there's 
possibly maybe money in the level twos right now with the, the um, uh, companies getting into this, I think are looking toward the future for when there's greater volume and there will be profit. And many of the level twos you see now are put in as amenities to other facilities. So there's some convenience stores in the mid-Atlantic states that are offering level two charging. I think it's level two. Um, and you know other hotels and businesses like that, ski areas are offering these things um, to, just as an amenity to their customers. Yeah. I'm just curious, when you were giving that level two count, would that include ones that people have had installed in their homes? No, these would be publicly available Public chargers. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone else have questions? Um, Mary? Do you have an idea of, like you own a car and you're gonna fuel up or? Yep you know, charge up or whatever. What percentage, like over the lifetime of that vehicle, will be from home charging and what percentage will be from? Yeah, for most people who have home charging available, they charge at home about 85% of the time. Um, because as Michelle said, even with current ranges, but especially with longer ranges, you're gonna get home again before you're out, unless yeah. you're, you're a sales person or a, on a long trip. Um, you're, you're, yeah, you're probably not gonna have to charge on the road. Um, so I think we covered um, the basic uh, goals for fast charging and the maps that we've come up with. Um, oh, I just wanted to mention too that VTrans does have um, electric vehicle charging as part of its strategic plan for 2018 to 2023. And there are really only about five major blocks in that plan. So for fast charging to be in there is a pretty heavy emphasis and priority. Um, so we will continue to work on that. So then the last thing um, I wanted to get into today is the uh, VWEDSE grant program. Uh, we talked about a little bit of this earlier under the national settlement uh, related to the Volkswagen fraud. Um, and you know, they, they put their devices in their cars that made it look like the emissions were cleaner when they were being tested and then the devices turned off when the cars were on the road to give them better performance. Um, it's really kind of shocking that people would do that, but they did. And, um, and it, it, it cost them billions and from all the billions they need to invest, they're hoping to make even more money. So I <laughs> it might all work out for Volkswagen. Uh, we'll see. I kind of actually hope it does. Um, so there were various appendices to this uh, nationwide settlement. I think A and B dealt directly with consumers. You could get a new car or refund, things like that. Um, under Appendix C, uh, Volkswagen subsidiary Electrify America needs to spend $2 billion nationwide on electric vehicle charging infrastructure um, and some education and outreach. And it's all going to be brand neutral. And uh, they're underway. They're going to have four investment cycles. We've been trying to persuade them to invest in Vermont. We've missed cycle one. We'll probably miss cycle two. So maybe we'll get something in three or four. But because of our low traffic volume, we're just not an attractive place for somebody to, to put uh, money down if they want to uh, make money in the long run. Um, but one thing that's interesting to note is that um, Electrify America admits that even after spending all $2 billion, it's probably going to only meet 10% of the nation's charging needs. So there is going to be a huge demand. And I think a, um, a half a billion has to go to California, but the rest is not apportioned. So they don't have to invest in Vermont if they don't want to. Um, under Appendix D, um, the states got uh, essentially formula funding out of the settlement based on how many of these um, um, uh, defeat systems, cars with defeat systems were sold, and um, Vermont likes Volkswagens, so we, we ended up with $18.7 million, um, and under the terms of the settlement, uh, Vermont is entitled to dedicate up to 15% of that amount, or $2.8 million, to passenger vehicle charging equipment. Um, and as I, as I said, the remaining amount, the 85% is going to go to heavy-duty uh, vehicles, uh, including transit and school buses. Um, and under that 85% of the, the big chunk, 
uh, you can include charging infrastructure for the heavy duty vehicles as part of your investment. You just can't include passenger vehicle charging infrastructure. That's under the 15%. Um, so a and &R delegated responsibility for administering the um, passenger vehicle charging infrastructure grant program to ACCD because they have some prior experience with grant programs to downtown areas for charging infrastructure and uh, a and was at about capacity. Um, an interagency inter team supports ACD and that includes, yes? Excuse me. I'm sorry, Agnes, if you could just say ACD. Sure. Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Sure. So the, the interagency team includes VTRANS, Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Buildings and General Services, and uh, the Department of Health. Um, so uh, ACCD has just awarded funds in the first grant round. Uh, funding for the first round was capped at $400,000 um, out of the 2.4 million available after administrative expenses. Uh, there were uh, over $1.6 million of requests, so the, the program was uh, way oversubscribed, and uh, I think you know just by that measure alone, quite successful. Um, funding went or will go to uh, nine different towns and organizations across the state. I think there's going to be a press release about this in the next day or two. Um, most of the um, uh, uh, yeah, I wrote that wrong. It really shouldn't say. It should say some of the funding supported a DC fast charger, um, and the rest went to level two. So there's one DC fast charger that, that's uh, been offered funds, and that's in South Burlington. Um, and that was not one of the Du Bois and King sites, by the way. Um, so. Um, We've got about $2 million left, and uh, we're going to get going on the next round of grants uh, in um, one or two or three months. It'll probably be capped again at $400,000. And I think possibly eventually what we might do is uh, uh, create a carve out uh, in the funding for DC fast charges, like maybe have a grant round that's just about fast charging or where there's a specific sum of money that will go exclusively to fast charging. Um, right now, um, we're waiting on that, and one of the reasons is because we'd like the PUC to address uh, the issue of charging for charging and demand charges, which are going to affect fast charging, and some other things. So we think we might be more successful if we wait for the PUC's recommendations and uh, uh, rulemaking or legislation to uh, embody those. And possibly uh, 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars would be needed to build out the, the basic fast charging network in Vermont, uh, you know, based on this map, uh, DNK sites and, and maybe a few others. Um, and it, it's just not going to be profitable at this point, um, but some companies may be willing to get in with the incentive that we're providing. Uh, with an idea of maybe profiting in the future. And VTRANS does have an additional th additional $300,000 set aside for EV charging, and we're not exactly sure what we're going to do with that yet. It might go to charging facilities at uh, park and rides, uh, uh, probably through some kind of grant program, again, so we don't have to own or operate the chargers. And um, it could be used to, to go with fast charging. Yes. Yes. Just looking at the 300,000 that's marked out, um, I'm, I'm making an, uh, a leap that may not be making that, that the 400,000 uh, cap covered potentially the cost of one DCFC, is that true? Uh, no. Um, They're not that costly? No, it wasn't. I can't remember offhand. Um, what, what happened is that there was an overall cap on the grant program of 400,000. And then there was an overall cap by county, and I can't remember the figure. It might have been 200,000. And we ended up with a situation after all the scoring where uh, two pricey projects in Chittenden County came in. One, <laughs> yeah, one, one was for a fast, one, I think it was for two fast chargers in South Burlington, and the other was for a whole bank of um, level two chargers, uh, maybe at the University Mall or City Market or someplace. Um, I 
can't remember specifically. But what we did is, uh, because the cap was exceeded, we scaled them both back. And so they're going to they're gonna be, each be made an offer, which is, look, here's how much we can give you. Um, and the, uh, the, the fast charging folks can either build both fast chargers for less, or they can come in with a new proposal for one fast charger, which will then fund and then we'll pick off somebody else at the, the next on the list. And I, th I think the fast charging project, uh, it might have been in the area of 90 or $100,000. So the 300000 if you were looking at the um, level two, would cover several, would yes, be multiple? Yes, probably, depending how many stations, yeah. So on the 300000 in the VTrans budget, I think um, the objective of those funds, and we haven't finalized this objective at this point, but would be to um, figure out how we can best leverage the um, VW EVSE program and the VTrans money to make sure that we have the fast chargers in all the locations that are strategically outlined in the Du Bois and King report. Okay. And to the extent that we can make that happen and still have money from the 300,000 left over, because we do want public-private partnerships for mm -hmm. these, then we would probably look at level two chargers um, in um, maybe rest areas or other locations um, that would be appropriate to where the need is. So the parking rides you are looking at the fast charger. Yeah, I mean either a parking ride or somewhere near an interstate interchange. I mean we're, we're really trying to um, make sure that, and it's not just interstates, but it could be Route Seven in right. um, Rutland right. or Bennington or Manchester. Make sure that the highly traveled routes in the yeah. state, um, where we're going to have interconnections um, with people that are doing through travel. Uh, or um, and it's not necessarily heavy travel because where there are prints in the state, we just need to have a fast charger. It could be could be in Canaan. I, I don't think that's on the map, but um, <laughs> but um, that we have um, populated those in a place where a person is likely to get off and spend 20 minutes on the fast charger charging. Um, the the level two chargers are a little complicated when it comes to the. Um, the park and ride locations because oftentimes people are leaving a car to park and ride for eight or ten hours uh, and uh, you can get your level two charge in about three hours and so we don't want that level two charger tied up with somebody who's leaving their car there all day that's why we're building our new park and rides with level one charging so you can just plug in and leave your car there all day and hopefully you come back and have a full charge so um, it's still a work in progress. We're trying to make sure we get as much bang for the buck as we possibly can at the right location for the type of charging we're trying to incentivize. I think I've been through all my prepared marks and we've covered a bunch else, so um, if I'm still available for questions if there are any. We have covered a lot. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Yes, Mark. No question or comment. I, I just want to, you know, appreciate all that you're doing in trans. Um, you know, I've been on this committee, this is my eleventh year, and, and I feel like there's you know, a, a real effort to move forward on this, um, given what we know about what's happening in the climate, given the dire reports that we got this fall from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the lack of action from the federal government, and states can set an example. So, you know, it's it's a start, and, and I really appreciate what you're doing. So, you. Well, I appreciate all you're doing as well. Thank you. Well, I know it was mentioned earlier on the Drive Electric uh, Vermont connection, and I just would encourage people to look at their website because it's really helpful to go on it. And it would be a, it's a great interface for just a public use. Okay, I just wanted to say one more thing too, and I think people need to remember this. But this is also economically beneficial and beneficial to our public health in terms of you know the, the kind of emissions that come out that affect air quality and asthma and things like that. So you know it should be a, a win for the environment and for public health and for people's pocketbooks naturally. Great. Yes. I brought two copies of my testimony. Did I need to do that? I think the website. Yeah, do you want them? Okay. Them. All right, good. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So we actually have a break until... Uh
state of Iowa. Could you cultivate the Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Some people are at a press conference, oh. so maybe not. Okay. Okay. Uh, shall I, I still get going now? Or? Yes. Yeah. Please. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, for the record, my name is David Pelletier. I work for the uh, Agency of Transportation in the Policy and Planning section. I work closely with Ms. Michelle and her, and her group. Um, and she trusts you so much that she's, she's left. Apparently, she's unless she's, she's, she's coming back. back. Yeah. <laughs> she's having second thoughts. <laughs> no, uh, yes, uh, so uh, here I'm, I'm here to uh, just give a, a brief presentation on the completion of the long range, state's long range transportation plan. And forgive me, I've I'm uh, all right, so we're gonna. I'm, I'm a little uh, technology challenged if you can get <laughs> right. I'm a phone and laptop guy, I'm not a tablet guy, so this is like this is good. I'm stretching out today a little bit. Um, so I will uh, kind of fumble with my paper here because I do have a few notes, um, but just a brief agenda to kind of frame what we're going to talk about here. Um, a quick uh, overview of the purpose and context of the state's long range transportation plan. Um, very brief on process and approach to updating it. I don't want to get too much into that, but there, there, is, um, there are a couple slides that kind of provide an overview, overview of how we um, went about the public process and the um, uh, stakeholder engagement process. And then most importantly, the, really the goals and strategies to implement the, um, the Long Range Transportation Plan is what we'll focus on mostly. Um, so purpose and context of the plan. This is, um, this is uh, kind of a, a broad, high-level plan. It looks out, it's required um, by federal law to look out at least 20 years. So we chose 2040 as our target um, year for our out year for the plan for the horizon. Um, it doesn't mean we're going to only update it in, in 2040 and do everything we have to do between now and then. We update this preferably every five years or so. It's actually been a number of years more than that since the last update. Um, time slipped by us. and. The last adopted plan was 2009, so um, it was it was much longer than we'd like for an update uh, 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 an update cycle. But one of the benefits that um, that provided was that there was a lot to talk about in this plan. Much has changed in the past decade or so in terms of technology and transportation trends. Um, so it was a good uh, a good uh, uh, plan to dig into and, and, and take a look at transportation in the broadest sense. This does cover all modes of transportation. Um, and if you look at the, the inverted pyramid there on the screen, it kind of gives the context of the, the few major plans that we house in the Agency of Transportation. This is the broadest and highest level. It's very much a um, setting general directions and priorities for the agency and for transportation in Vermont. Um, and then at the very bottom of the pyramid, you see the modal plans. Those are the rail plan, the transit plan, et cetera. That, that's where you'll see actual programs and projects really well de defined. This is not a project plan per se. So you're going to see more generalities, less about a uh, specific project, which you'll find out in those modal plans. Um, the one other thing really to mention here is just that I, I made a point of underlining that it's the Vermont Long Range Transportation Plan. This isn't just a plan for the Agency of Transportation. Um, right below that, you see the, the AOT strategic plan mentioned in that pyramid. That's our, our work plan for the coming five years or so, where um, we pull from this long range plan um, and, and kind of take priorities and work on them in a more focused manner. And some of the things, I won't get into that because that's a whole other rabbit hole, but um, you know, some of our focus in the next five years or so have to do with some of the issues that you might imagine. Um, uh, EV, uh, infrastructure and electric truck, uh, electric vehicle um, system build out. Um, some of our you know our, our rail initiatives to increase passenger <laughs> service, in, in, intercity bus initiatives, etc. Um, so you'll see some of those things coming to the more or uh, in, in some of the more um, kind of tactical and shorter range plans. On that for now, okay, we could talk about that for hours or I could, you could probably sleep through it. Um, process and approach. We, um, we very, whoops. We um, were very deliberate in making sure that this wasn't a, a, a long drawn out process uh, kind of culminating in a massive document that was really unapproachable and hard for the average person to, to digest. So we really um, aimed for a succinct document. It's about 60 pages or so. There's a link at the end of this presentation to take you to the actual 
final document if you want to get into any more detail about what we talk about today. Um, and in terms of the update process, we really relied on our existing framework of relationships with the regional planning commissions um, and many other state agencies and uh, interest groups, um, such as AARP, Local Motion, uh, for bike pet issues, uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, uh, the Vermont Truck and Bus Association, our Rail Advisory Committee, um, Public Transit Advisory Committee. We kind of relied on the existing framework rather than going out and doing massive, um, very intensive uh, public meetings uh, from scratch. So we were pretty efficient in that way in, in terms of the update process. Um, let's see. Unless you have any specific questions on that, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the process part at that. and Feel free to follow up after or ask questions. Um, this is a very uh, uh, basic timeline of the process. Um, and you can see we met at three points with a stakeholder uh, meeting that was, that was formed specifically for this um, process. And then you can see mention of meeting with the Regional Transportation uh, Advisory Committees through the, the Regional Planning Commissions at a couple points as well. And you can see it took place over about a year period, culminating um, really at the end of this, this, uh, this past summer. All right, getting into the, the material itself here. So the, um, the vision statement that the stakeholder committee and, and, and input led us to is on the screen there, and it's, um, it's really kind of a modification of the existing vision statement um, from the 2009 plan. It's very, it's big picture and broad, as you might imagine, especially in a plan of this nature. Um, but the committee ultimately thought that it really reflected um, the priorities in, in, a, in a really high level, broad sense, what the plan needed to be um, working towards. So, moving right into the, uh, into the goals. And the way the, way the plan is, is set up is that there are six primary goals and a uh, number of strategies under each goal um, to, uh, to implement that goal. And what these slides, really the rest of this presentation shows about 10 or so slides here, are, um, are each of the goals. And then the, uh, the graphics or the pictures really illustrate some of the specific strategies that are under each of those goals. It's not completely inclusive, but it gives you a good idea of the flavor of the strategies that are included there. Uh, so goal one, uh, improve safety and security across all modes of transportation. This slide is really, um, is really uh, reflective of the highway um, side of things. And you can see uh, uh, from the left to the right, uh, click it or ticket, um, uh, seatbelt check stop for reflecting our, our pretty extensive highway safety program that we, um, that some of which we house at Agency of Transportation, kind of the infrastructure components, and also, of course, our DMV enforcement component and state police partners. Um, so there's a big, a big component of that in, in, our, um, in our, our strategies. Um, the, middle, uh, the middle photo shows um, uh, a work in a work zone, and, and work zone safety has been a big push in recent years as well. Um, obviously, uh, those workers are extremely vulnerable in those situations, as are drivers if they're not being attentive through those, through those areas. And then, um, last but not least, over on the right there is just a reflection that um, in light of, of uh, uh, you know, especially in light of initiatives like Complete Streets and just our general push to have a really multimodal transportation system, um, vulnerable users like bicyclists and pedestrians um, really need uh, to be considered in all of, all of the work we do and, and uh, accommodations need to be made for those users. Is that me? <laughs> I asked because I've never seen anyone else have different types of panniers on. It's not, you know, it's, a, it's an old photo, and I actually can identify the, the rider. I don't think you would mind, but that's Chapin Spencer. Yeah, um, it's an old photo, and I've been yeah. criticized for, you need a new photo, but I, I mean, this is a great photo, right? So, yeah, that's Chapin from his local motion days, I think. Yeah. But if you want to submit one, I can use an updated one. Thank you very much. Uh, so continuing goal one, there are, safety and security are so paramount in, in what we do in, in this plan that there are, I think, three slides for this one goal. The rest of the goals, I promise, there's one slide each. 
not to, to make them any less important, but I couldn't capture it all on one slide here. Um, and this, this slide is really um, to, to reflect that we are talking about all modes here. Um, and rail safety, um, especially as we work to um, increase the, uh, you know, the condition and, and the speeds and the, and the effectiveness of our rail, um, our rail network, we need to be cognizant of, um, of crossings, crossing safety, and just the general condition of the, uh, of the, the system for safety and security purposes. Same, go same goes with our, um, our public uh, use airport system. They've got very specific needs um, to their industry, and we have um, you know, our, ourselves and other organizations and advocacy um, groups are, are, are keeping a watch on, on our airports to make sure they have the, the correct um, uh, safety features, security features. And then um, this last uh, slide for safety and security, reflecting safety and security, is really to capture the technology side of things. Um, and there's been so much change over the past decade, and we expect that to, to really continue, and hopefully to be something that we can really leverage in terms of safety and security. And so these few, um, these few images here from left to right, uh, the leftmost image is, uh, is a, a photo of uh, a screen bank in, the, in our transportation operations center in Berlin up by the airport. And this is where all the, um, the information that we collect through our roadway information um, sensors, those posts you see on the side of the interstates, um, and a whole host of other um, information sources that are out there are, are channeled into this so that our um, our operations staff can keep an eye on road conditions, incidents, and can, can leverage technology to manage those and hopefully avoid them when possible. But this is where you see, um, you know, when you see the weather advisories on the variable message signs, there's somebody typed that in, probably from there, maybe remotely, but that's where that stuff is being um, piped out of. The, um, the center picture is, is you know, a bit cartoonish, but really reflects the fact that vehicle technology and infrastructure technology is evolving rapidly. You'll talk about, and I'm sure you've already talked about, um, uh, you know, vehicle automation and the various technologies associated with that. Cars will increasingly um, uh, become more complex and communicate with each other for safety purposes, um, and also with infrastructure, and that's, that's what's going on with that signal. Um, right there is um, just the concept of vehicles communicating electronically with um, with infrastructure to increase safety um, uh, and, and also increase effectiveness of the of the transportation network. You can squeeze more capacity out of the road if we've got people coordinating more um, more effectively. And technology has some promise for some of those those uh, advantages as well. And then on the right. Um, just a quick screen grab from a tool that um, Agency of Transportation has been developing in, in partnership with a few other organizations to take a look at how um, uh, rivers and roads relate and take a, take a look based on data, based on experience, and based on information about river corridors and highway infrastructure where we might need to um, uh, be making investments to avoid um, really costly and um, dangerous uh, uh, transportation infrastructure damage. Goal two, preserve and improve the condition and performance of the multimodal transportation system. Um, these photos were chosen pretty deliberately, and again, my, my photo on the right is of Chittenden County, very, very dated, but it's a great photo, so apologies. Um, these three areas really are pavement condition, bridge condition, and travel time reliability is what it's known as in the industry, and that's basically just um, a reflection of congestion on roads. These three areas are ones um, that we're particularly interested in, um, in that there are federal requirements uh, for reporting on all of these conditions, and we are required now to set, um, set goals for ourselves and show progress towards them. So what was the best management practice for many years, and what we've been doing anyway is, is now a requirement um, through the, um, the federal transportation uh, authorization. Um, so these are these are important considerations. Can I ask, is that our snooper truck? Um, In the middle, or don't we know? I don't know. I'm not sure what piece of equipment that is. If that's, I can't, 
I can't tell from this photo if it is. Apologies. Is it the thing that? You well, that's what I. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering if it's the one we invested in, or if it's back when they were still hiring out the. Yeah, it's not. That, you went down to see that. Yeah, right no, down here. It, it looks like it. But like I said, you can't see the whole. Thing. That might be it. I would assume that that's it. Yeah. yeah. We only have one of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fabulously expensive, probably. Yeah, those are cheap. I think I saw it being used um, down by down by the um, Formula Ford dealership in the roundabout. There's a rail bridge right there that was being inspected over the past maybe six months or so. It just it looks really big in this picture, which is why I hesitate. But it's the same idea. If we only have one bar, that's got to be. That's got to be. Well, we hired out the yeah you know the job before yeah. we paid for all, so it could be if the slide's like six years old, it might not right. be ours. I'll look, I'll just <laughs> for the novelty of it, I will look into it and find out. I should know. Um, goal three, provide mobility options and accessibility for all users of the transportation system. Um, these images uh, are somewhat self-explanatory, but um, on the right there, public transit and, and transportation for all users of the system are, um, are paramount uh, uh, goals to make sure that everybody has access. Um, we've, we've got a pretty strong, solid um, transportation or public transportation system, especially for a small rural state. Um, we've had a uh, few intercity bus routes start up in the, in the past five or six years. One very recently down in Bennington County, connecting over to, um, uh, to Rensselaer, New York, to the, um, to the train station over there. Um, so we're, we're working these, uh, these uh, often known as alternative transportation modes, but um, we're really trying to make sure that we have a comprehensive system and that everybody has access to it. And then the photo on the right is um, is an image from an online trip planner that um, that we that we manage uh, through the Go Vermont program. Uh, within it's actually um, Ross McDonald within the, the public transit program. You maybe have already heard from him down here. Yeah. And and that's just to re to reflect the fact that um, we really. Once we invest in these systems, or even as we invest in them, we need to make, make sure people know about them um, and make sure that they have tools to use them so that they are easy um, to take advantage of because everybody knows um, if one has access to a personal automobile, it's, it's usually a lot easier to just pop in that and go from point A to point B. So if we're going to get people um, that have the option, uh, choice riders on these other modes, we need to make it convenient and, um, and easy to do. So we'll continue on, you know, there's strategies to continue these, these programs and, and investments in those. Um, kind of the, um, the catalyst for a lot of positive change in some of these communities. So that's one of the, one of the areas that are, are, that's, that are emphasized in, in this, uh, in the goal, in the strategies that are this goal. Now, Brian, yeah. Mike, do you guys recognize him all the time? Oh yeah. Oh, you did it? Oh, yeah. Twigs and eats. Yeah. Fine jewelry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. When we did our streetscape, we spent a lot of time talking about which light fixtures. There's a there's a consultant that definitely got a few extra hours out of the debate. <laughs> uh, in the middle there, um, you know, in the, in the, this I was. I recognize that. Yeah, I, I probably, most of you probably do. This is the uh, the uh, island line and the causeway in Colchester. Yeah, no, you shouldn't have tried to show me. It's not a, uh, Patty probably doesn't recognize it. It's causeway. You do? Yeah. Yeah. And this I guess is, it kind of has to be. And, and the, you know, this is unique enough that this was the cover photo for, um, this This is a screen grab that I took of a, of a piece. I can't remember if it was in the Globe or New York Times. I should, I should figure that out. But it was an article about the, you know, the best five um, bike paths in New England, like gotta gotta visit sort of things, and so you know, I you know it kind of goes without saying that this is the kind of thing that we want to be known for. I think, and and to the degree that we can um, make investments and coordinate with other agencies and partners to develop these facilities, um, I think it really stands to benefit the state in a number of ways, including obviously the tourism uh, dollars that it brings to the state. And then on the right, um, you know, just reflective of the fact that we've been for many years working on some pretty important passenger rail service extensions, um, uh, one to Montreal and then the Western Quarter extension. Um, so those will continue. That's about as close to the specific projects as we as we get to really mentioning in this plan, just because they are such um, they are such premier projects and stand to really be a, 
I think, a, a boon to the, to the state for, for uh, economic vitality. <clears throat> Goal five in the plan uh, is practice environmental stewardship. And uh, these few photos here represent some of our bigger initiatives um, and, and work areas, both at the agency and with other organizations as we implement this plan. Um, and on the bottom is a, is a stormwater um, retrofit of, a, of an interstate interchange. I think it's exit 10, although I'm not positive. Um, and that just reflects the importance of, of water quality. And I know that you all have um, worked a lot in the past couple of years on water quality issues and making sure the transportation is doing its part. Um, and so we have, um, we have uh, a lot of, of energy being put towards that, investments being made in that. Um, and on the, uh, on the center top, uh, that doesn't need much ex explanation. You know, we are involved with many partners in um, ensuring that the, uh, the charging infrastructure built out in the state is, um, is, is taking place and taking place in the right places and in the right way. And uh, we'll continue to be involved in, um, in that process as well. And then on the right top, um, that is a, a partner of ours from um, Agency of Natural Resources. And that, what he's showing there is, um, is, a, is a really um, sensitive wildlife uh, habitat corridor. And we're trying to do more um, coordination and work with, um, with the experts in these areas to make sure that when we're making improvements or working on um, our highway and, and transportation infrastructure, we're being cognizant of where um, that habitat is, trying to at, at, uh, at, do our very best to minimize impact to it, certainly. And then if there are ways to modify projects or, or the infrastructure um, that would actually improve conditions, um, at the same time that we're out there doing work, we're going to be doing anyways um, to incorporate those design elements into, uh, into the infrastructure. And then um, finally, uh, goal six, last but not least, support livable, healthy communities. Guess on the community in that photo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and again, like a, a similar situation, like a convergence of a number of projects and agencies and organizations and municipalities making, um, kind of, a, you know, a concerted investment in a downtown area. Um, and, and this happens to be this is no, a real. No, I'm, I'm oh, it's a scoring. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You got it. Yeah. And that's just, that's just to reflect that, that you know, the, the investment and the focus isn't completely on the villages and downtowns. It's the connections between them and, um, and you know, these other, these other facilities that sometimes go unnoticed, but, but really are important to, um, to our communities and, and overall public health as well. And I, this is really the last slide about before my, my contact information and the, and the link to the plan itself. And I just wanted to share um, some of the themes that we heard in the feedback and the outreach as we traveled around the state. We went to all 11 regional planning commission, re commission regions and sponsored um, public meetings to, to, uh, to solicit input. A lot of the input came from their transportation advisory committee members themselves. They often had um, guests from the public that joined. Um, to, to provide input as well, but these were some of the things that popped for me um, in particular and that were kind of uh, heard in, in, you know, more than one region. And, um, you know, since we, we sort of ended on that with the Missisquoi Trail and, and some of the other slides there, this emphasis on recreation-related uh, tourism, we really heard about, um, about that in many areas of the state, but um, the Northeast Kingdom, um, there's so much going on up there with, with recreation tourism related to bicycling. And then the LVRT, the, um, the, the Memorial Valley Rail Trail, we heard a lot about, um, about that and just wanting to see that proceed and progress to its, its fruition for the, you know, for the same reason that we saw, we've seen so much success in some of those other uh, facilities like the Colchester, um, that bike, bike path photo. This is another like greater regional, northeast region draw uh, to get people up here to recreate. Um, we saw consistent support for public transit and passenger rail, as reflected in the, in the presentation here. Um, we did see, it's nice to get kudos every now and then, although I'm sure we wouldn't get this compliment today. Um, observed improvement in, in road surface conditions and just an appreciation for 
maintaining our, our existing assets. Um, we get a lot of work to do this spring. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, let's see. Making sure that we, you know, appropriately address uh, the, the vehicle technology opportunities as they arise. Um, and then, yeah, leveraging technology and, uh, you know, using intelligent transportation systems. That's the ITS, my apologies, uh, for system management. So, again, that transportation operations center photo that I showed you and making sure that where it's, uh, it's wise to do, we're putting an in infrastructure that can be um, leveraged uh, like that. David, what's uh, address connected and autonomous vehicle? Yeah. What do we do connected? That's really... Um, uh, that's really the, just the reflection of what I mentioned earlier, that as, as these technologies have evolved, the car, cars themselves will be communicating with each other and with the infrastructure, um, increasingly so. And, you know, you have lane assist in, in some cars right now, and, and assistive braking, and some of these technologies that are sort of confined to the vehicle that you're in. Um, I think, you know, what you'll see more and more, and, and what we're seeing, um, uh, technology moving towards are vehicles that actually communicate with each other um, so that you might not have only one car seeing another and slowing down you might actually have um, platooning opportunities to get more efficiency out of the network uh, where vehicles are communicating to keep an even space between the, you know between themselves um, and then again um, you know the autonomous part is I think you know the, the part that gets so much press the self-driving cars if you will um, so, you know, I think everybody agrees, and you can see it rolling out slowly. Um, everybody agrees it's going to continue to evolve. I don't think that we're, I think everybody also agrees we're not going to wake up uh, one morning in, in five or even ten years and all the cars are going to be driving themselves. It's going to be a long, slow process um, for fleet replacement and, and technology evolution. Uh, Laura? Is the connectivity... Um does it include, too, when you were showing us the traffic light yeah. cartoonish picture yeah. where it's speaking? That's part of the whole connectivity Yeah, exactly. Concept. Yeah. Co connected vehicle technology is usually framed in kind of two um, components. Uh, you see vehicle to vehicle or V2V sometimes, and, and vehicle to infrastructure, V2I. And those are kind of the two, those, those are the two main tracks, and we're keeping, keeping an eye on both of them. Is there any um, federal or state regulation about how agencies like VTrans use the data that's collected by as we roll out devices and we have yeah. video and we know where cars are and there's identifying data that can tell you whose car is what? It seems like it's the Wild West right now, if I understand it, but is there anything, and are, are there conversations happening that you're aware of about protecting individual and data as we roll out all of these devices? Yeah, I, I hear the question. Um, I cannot provide a real specific answer to that. I don't know. I've, I've not been involved in, um, in conversations at that level of detail. Um, and I know some of this is probably bigger picture kind of federal FCC and, and you know, the issues at kind of the federal level that will dictate what we can do down here um, in terms of information and whatnot. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I have nothing specific to transportation that I'm aware of. I, I'm recalling Joseph Alley. Right. Telling us that you know we bought a, a trove of data right. that told us about you know vehicle locations. And, right, right. Um, I don't think any of that had identifiable data, but it was exactly. pinging off of Bluetooth yep. from cell phones, and that's the yep. thing that gets to me is that yep. smart people will know how to figure out where those came from eventually. Yep. Okay. Anything else, David? Yeah, I mean, so uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, if you do uh, want to take a look at the, the plan itself, it's available at that link. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, reach out to us. Well, this was great. And actually, a very nice way to finish our morning because we Good. had a lot of information leading up to you. This was actually kind of more pleasant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Like, Please. The Vermont Life version of <laughs> Well, into my next presentation, so that people are all, you know, very, very uh, pleased. At the end. Yeah. All right, great. I know. Springs around the corner, right? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.